Ryan Hipwood, we're doing it, mate. It's happening. It's been a while coming, really. It has, mate. It has. I feel like we're old mates from way back. It's the <laughs> yeah. first time we've actually met. It's a bit like that, isn't it? Yeah, so you're getting into the podcast game. I am. I'm going to give it a crack, mate. I uh, The extreme sports world is, a, as you know, it's 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 a hustle. Yeah, and, uh, and so I'm just trying to tie a bit more stuff in when I travel and... Obviously got some pretty interesting friends and they've always got some funny t- stories to tell. Yeah. Um, you know, when we go out and get on the pierce, you know, we're always talking some really interesting shit. So, you know, I thought if I can, you know, bring a recorder and get some good equipment and yeah, make it, make it something, then why not? And it's definitely, um, it's a way like, I think that once you get rolling, cause how, have you done many of them before? Like actually sat down or is this your first like proper one? I've done podcasts okay, before with yeah. other people, yeah. but I haven't, I haven't really hosted a podcast, so to speak yeah. live or like yeah. I, I've done trial podcasts and stuff that have, you know, gone all right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a virgin, man. I'm just going to throw myself in the deep end and That's see right. what you'll, happens. You'll be fine. <laughs> I think you'll find though, like it's, it's going to be interesting for you because I think you'll find you'll actually mates that you've hung out with for years and years and years. Like you'll hear some first time stuff and you'll get really like, you'll get closer with your mates. Like I've found with doing this that, and I guess you, the other thing too is like, you start to be critical of, um, yourself as a conversationalist so like i'll listen i mean i've kind of stopped listening to these as much as i did at the start because i'm yes. like oh how's it sound and this and then you sort of start doing a bunch of them to wear like you hate your own voice oh well, i kind of got over that because yeah. it's like well fuck you can't change <laughs> yeah it. you can't change <laughs> it so you, it's like you're just, stuck with your own voice aren't you, you yeah but there is some good that. editing you can do yeah. so you can make yourself sound a bit sexier yeah. <laughs> or just be sick all the time yeah well you're a part of this game all right you that's what you do so you've got you know the editing software yeah. i'm screwed i'm just gonna have to rely on someone else to do yeah that sort of nah, they'll, they'll, they'll take care of you. but yeah you get like almost critical on yourself and i think as you go along you'll stop saying um as much and you can you actually critique the way that you talk you're like oh was i listening enough was i because i think that was the the hardest thing for me in the first few is um letting that you don't want silence yeah so exactly. you try and you're almost like overcompensating for, yeah. for it and I, you're jumping in you're like oh, but you hadn't finished what you said so it's like it's definitely like a learning curve eh? oh for sure i mean the trial ones that i did do the hardest thing for me was just to listen like i, yeah. I find like it was hard to be on the other spectrum and actually ask the questions but not talk yeah. and just you know let the questions roll out and or let that sorry let the answers roll out but um it, it's funny that you said that because i've i've heard my friends do podcasts and i learned more about my friends within these podcasts yeah. than what i even knew about them it was really wild like i heard one from mark matthews and we're, we're really tight friends and uh you know obviously you've gone through a lot of shit together and i learned a lot about deeper stuff about him in a podcast and what i you know he's ever told me you know i, I think it's just the australian way we don't really yeah, get too true. deep yeah. with our mates you know it, it's pretty rare that you do that but um i feel like with podcasts that's what it's all about you know learning stuff about someone that you just r- didn't really know much about you know much of yeah so. i think too it's it you definitely you know like for example we're a couple minutes in it's just still that it's like a if, yeah I've, you you watch ufc a lot right i do yeah, yeah it's like it. that first you know you're getting that first little thing there's a couple things being, and you're trying to get that flow yeah and then five you know four and a half minutes into the third yeah, round you're deep it. you forget where you are and you're just fucking going for it and yeah. like even the last couple that i've done have been because i guess at the start it was like guess and i know my guess well and uh for the most part like at the start like harley and and toby they're like really good friends of mine yeah but they're athletes so it's like there's that stuff to talk about people are going to listen to them because they're athletes yeah exactly and the last couple, like I just did one with Sam Moore. And I don't, do you know Sam Moore? He, um, possibly. Oh, he's a fucking legend. He, um, he started Fist Gloves. Oh, right. So, like, it's a glove. So, yeah, it's a moto different sort of world to where you're at. Yeah. But, um, we've been friends. I just posted a 
like one of those throwback pictures on Facebook of like eight years ago, me and him at a national together when we were both like 20 or 21 or whatever. And um, he's not a name dude. He's not an athlete. It's just, he's a friend of mine. Right. And I, I, I said, I come away on that podcast and I'm like, fuck man. Like, I don't know if I was that down to say what I said. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah. You're deep. You're in that three hour mark and you just forgot about everything. <laughs> and it's like all that, you know, all that stuff comes out. And the same with yeah. like uh, Jeff Weatherall. You'd know Jeff. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, he yeah. come on the other night. And um, yeah, we're just talking weird shit about like weird dreams. And, you know, so you just, yeah, there's definitely a different thing that happens when you're forced to turn off all your phones. And the only sound you can hear is my voice and vice versa. So it's just like super zones you into the, the conversation. It's I like a, it. It's a pretty weird deal. Yeah, I like it. And And to, you know, obviously look at someone in the eyes and tell them a proper story, it's... It's something that doesn't happen much. No. You know, people get intimidated, just whack the phone out. You're all good. You're kind of lost in that little moment. So it's sick. I reckon get back to... Campfire shit. Campfire shit and yeah. what it's all about. It, it's funny you say that because like, yeah, you pick up your phone and it's like, that's a barrier. It's, it's a like safety. a full it's little a safety. safety I've never thought of it like that. Yeah, people just, you know, especially, you know, younger generation, you know, if, if you try to look at them in the eyes, it's very hard to get anything out of them. Dude, and there is people. Whack, like just pull the phone out. No, this is like... Yeah, yeah. that little invisible thing. Yeah. There's people too, we were talking about it the other day, that they struggle to like look you in the eye. And there's definitely an awkwardness of, of just people in general now and like people that will shake your hand real soft. Yeah. Like I'm not a guy that's like fucking Try trying to, to be an alpha hand. male kind of deal, but I think... <laughs> I respect like a good firm handshake. Yeah, I have. I remember people that have like weak as piss handshakes. Just, oh yeah, and you're just like, and I think it's not they're not weak people. I think it's just that awkwardness some people have now. Eh? There's actually, there's actually some places like in Hawaii when I first went, it was a really gnarly place. You know, it was really localized and stuff. And you know, in Australia, I was I grew up shaking hands quite firm you know it was quite hard i've got a pretty old school sort of old man he's a bricky so yeah, he's yeah. kind of like a pretty hard dude hands are like a fucking 2001 <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and uh i went to hawaii as a kid and i thought oh you know like obviously it's a pretty sort of gnarly place back then it's yeah. like a wild west so you know they're they always going in for the handshake and uh and i'd go pretty hard I remember this one dude, I won't say his name, but he's a pretty heavy guy and I was only young and I went in and, and kind of went as hard as I could on his handshake <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, hey, he wanted to slap me in the face. Really? He's like, well, I thought you were disrespectful. You ever him. fucking do that again and I'll slap you. Like, <laughs> really? Yeah, it was like a disrespectful <clears throat> kind of... Full on. Yeah, it was gnarly. And, uh, and so yeah, it was really funny because I thought it was the right thing to do and... And obviously different cultures and stuff have different, yeah. you know. Well, that's like you go to Japan and you, you like they're bowing at you and you've got to, you've got to um, almost respect that they're showing you respect. Because like I, I remember when I first went there, I was that someone bowed and then I'd bow and then they'd bow and it's like, you can't be the last one to bow. They have to be the last one to bow to you. <laughs> yeah. You get like, it, it, it is Five weird. minutes like, of bowing. Just... Dude, I full did that <laughs> at a train station at a bakery once. <laughs> And, uh, um, I'm not submitting. I'm I'm bowing to the death. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, "Fuck, where do I stop?" Yeah. And I thought I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna be the dick if yeah. I don't return it." Yeah. And I, then I was like, "Man, this is just getting into a bit of a piss take now." Jesus what? But Christ. then yeah, someone was like, "Oh, he must be the last about to you." And I was like, "Oh, fuck!" All right. And I kept going deeper, and he'd go yeah. deeper. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably thinking, well, "What's, what's his, his dick, dick doing?" doing? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a like. It's funny you say that about Hawaii because. I love Hawaii and I love Hawaiians, but that it can be a weird place when it comes to that localism type stuff that goes down there. Oh, for sure. I mean, it is a weird place because, you know, I, I guess the, they got overridden, you know, like the, yeah. the Hawaiians, you know, it's kind of similar thing to what we, you, have, here. we have here, you yeah. know. And so I feel like because um, it is such a small island, there is kind of that still that heritage that they're trying to hang on to. So um, it can be, you know, pretty gnarly spot. And I feel like, you know, they take that whole localism thing to the next level. Some, some do. I mean, it's gotten a lot better now purely because, you know, obviously you can't 
do certain things in this day and age than what you could probably 10 years ago but mm. um I, I feel like you know they're probably still trying to hold on to that sort of thing and, and you, when you look at it like that it kind of makes sense um but yeah it's uh it's interesting it was um yeah especially that the, the north shore you know i went there as like a 14 year old for my yeah. first trip by myself and um got thrown in the deep end and it was an eye-opening experience kind of you know forced me to become a man pretty quick um you know surfing waves of the gold coast and then the old man's like nah you ready get over there and i was uh i was lucky enough i had a friend that i met up with over there that was a bit older and stayed with him but man it was a pretty crazy experience as a 14 year old surfing some of the biggest waves in the world and almost drowning and you know just seeing this whole new sort of culture and um it's yeah it was like it, it was pretty baffling what waves were you going after as a 14 year old in hawaii uh i mean i was along that that whole miracle mile that they yeah. call it now um but i didn't know like so you've obviously got like you've got um pipe and then back door then off the wall and there's it's like, like rocky it, so it's yeah. like are you staying away from the super heavy stuff as a 14 year old or are you sort of off the edge getting scrapped no, so how does it work well it's just like or are you just paddling out of pipe you have to fuck that yeah like as a kid you know i'm kind of like trying to make it as a pro and i've got older friends there and they're all like yeah, they're not going to let you go surf rockies yeah right you know my old man's like you're you know, going there to set a pipe, man. Yeah, exactly. Don't come home until you got a stand-up barrel. Yeah, pretty much. And so uh, the first person I met over there as a kid um, when I was like, yeah, it was, I think the first week was Jamie O'Brien. And uh, he kind of took me under his wing. He lived right there. Like the, the house that you line up with between pipe and backdoor was his house. And uh, he was the best guy. You know, he was a little white kid, but just, you know, ruled the joint. And... Uh, so I kind of looked up to him as a kid and we were friends and, and uh, it just kind of evolved from there. And I definitely don't think I would have been so comfortable in big ways if it wasn't from like hanging out with him and, mm. and pushing each other. And, uh, and, you know, we still do that now. And uh, yeah, I feel like there'd be, I wouldn't be a pro surfer or have any sort of career in surfing if it wasn't for, for like, you know, for him, really? especially in those early days. Yeah. It was wild. Do you remember your first legitimate pipe wave? I nearly drowned. My first, the first time I surfed it, I uh, paddled out. And it was, it was huge. It was like second reef, and I was Fuck. fourteen. And Jamie was obviously he lived there his whole life, so he's comfortable. And he's like, "Yeah, we're out there," and uh, paddled out. Got a second reefer on the head. So, in layman's terms, there's two reefs. There's a first ledge that you see, you know, mostly it breaks on, and then when it gets real big, it maxes out. And there's a second reef that rolls in from way, way outside. And, uh, you know, the whitewashes that come in through there are like, you know, 12, 15 foot Hawaiian, which is, you know, it's it's tall. You know, yeah. It's as tall as the, the front of the factory here. And uh, so I got like two or three of them on the head, got wrapped up in a guy's leash and, you know, pinned to the bottom and basically came in in tears just thinking I was, you know, pretty much nearly drowned. I'm going to play golf now. And then <laughs> Jamie's old man's quite similar. You know, he's... Uh, yeah, he's a white guy. He came from Australia and uh, he was a lot... Oh, li really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. He's got Aussie in him. No so, shit. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he's just like, yeah, you'll be right. You know, it's it's all part of it, kid. And uh, there was no hugs or kisses on the beach. It was just like, get over it and yeah. the next day you're back out there. Because and... everyone's probably had the same thing, you know what oh, I mean? It's, it's not yeah. like you were special. No, no. You know, he... Uh, yeah, it was just... It was just, it was what it was, you know. You're in a man's world and you're a kid, so get over it. Yeah. You know, don't surf it or it's go to Rockies, the way, It's you know? probably the way to do it, really. Like, I think nowadays there's probably a lot of pandering that goes on that sort of, I guess, uh, doesn't exactly hasten, hasten the learning curve. Like, what you have well, to go through mate, we'll is like pipe, drowning, yeah. get back out there. There's no like, oh, let's go surf this little wave. Let's find your feet again. We'll get you back out there. Mate, there's guys getting bashed on the beach. I was sleeping like with five or six, you know, Jamie had five or six mates that used to stay over. We were all on the floor. Mate, these days, these kids have have it on, oh, a, yeah. on a platter. You know, they're in mansions. They got filmers. They got trainers. We had nothing. We were just like, it was just, it was fun. You know, looking back at Raw. it. 
it was raw it was really raw and um you know it makes you you know it makes you a man it makes you step up i guess yeah i want to before i forget because i probably will i got an idea me and flick palmateer kind of started brainstorming some shit because she's heavy Mm. she surfs some big stuff yeah but um we were talking about like uh the sort of the big wave world tour and she's like oh one day i could sort of just see it all being together what would you think about um like three ct events and then three big wave events but there was like a top sort of mix from both tours and then that dude wins like a unified world championship so like say you like say it's you ian walsh and um like Twiggy, like yep, let's just yeah, throw yeah. three names out there that yep. are like the top, let's say you got the top three midway through the season of the big, big wave, wave dudes and yep. then the top three of the w- like CT yeah. dudes and then you you, amal- you combine a couple of events or you give them both wild cards into each event and then you have like a, an overall world champ because I think that's where it needs to go, man. It'd be interesting to see Toledo out Jaws. That's what we <laughs> said. <laughs> we're like, hey, guys, Toledo, you right. better be throwing J Bass on. You don't want nothing to do with that top three. Yeah, exactly. He'll, uh, yeah, I mean. But like, you look at like, it's not, Kelly would go, Owen sure. would go, John obviously is gone. You know, like, I, there's dudes. So it, it's like, should we be calling like the CT dude the world champ if there's these other waves that guys are paddling? And then you've got your separate world tour. They got their world tour. It's like, can we make one dude that's you know, like the fucking dude? You know they can do it though, right? Oh, I know yeah. they could do it. No, no, like literally. Oh, the world. Tour. Yeah, yeah. That like they've they're allowed to put their hand up and go. Yeah. I want to go in Nazare, or yeah. I want to go on the Jaws event. They can do that whenever they want. Yeah, they've just got a lot riding on on that CT, on that. Yeah, yeah. You know the money's there. It's yeah. not in the big wave game yet. I mean, it will come, but right now. But I, mean, I think that would be a huge part of bringing the money in. Is oh, like for you sure. get, you say, you get John Kelly, um, Owen, some dudes that are just ready to throw down. Like I could see that big wave event, and uh, like just the idea of having a, not that they're not a legit world champion, obviously they are, but like the just the the title of having those kind of events, and then you get both, and then I mean you can win. You say you go Chopes Pipe, and j bay are like the three that you guys have to enter yep and it's just like a series within a series I and- yeah i mean it's a, it's a good idea for sure um it, it's it's hard purely because those guys are looking at it and they're just saying well we're going for a world title this is where the money's at yeah and this is what we need to do unless the wsl looked at it and said you know there could be something really cool here if we combine these make these guys kind of compete yeah or, or give them more more of an incentive to do that yeah then obviously i think that's going to benefit both sides yeah. especially more so the the big wave thing because it, it will obviously bring the bigger names to those events and you know it'll, there's already a lot of people are always going to watch big waves it's just to obviously get that to get it to that next step and to bring a bit more a bit more finance behind it and get the sponsors to go shit you know we need to support this more um I think you do need to bring the, those names to it. And, uh, you know, I, I haven't really told a whole lot of people this, but I've been pretty heavily involved in, in starting big wave events. One in particular in Australia. I can't say too much about it just because legal stuff. But yeah. um, I feel like there's room in a lot more specialty events. I feel like, you know, focusing on better locations, heavier locations... And then obviously having a really interesting format and even, you know, having those events more often like a slab tour, for instance, in Australia. Yeah. You know, the Kate Fear event. Um, that was ridiculous the last time they run that. Like, yeah. That was one of the biggest spectacles of surfing I've ever seen. Yeah. So me and, me and Mark had that idea. Where it actually stemmed from me writing a bunch of goals on a pizza box yeah, right. <laughs> about six years ago and uh we're like man we have to we have to start some events at these locations because people were just losing it mm. um you know every time it broke was on the news and and so that's that whole thing kind of stemmed from from an idea and you know i'd love to to see more specialty events and that's what i'm trying to push for at the moment especially within australia we don't have a world tour stop here 
Um, you know, we've got some amazing waves, but unfortunately, some of those waves, you know, the locals don't want events there mm. and they're really underground. And um, yeah, it's just kind of one of those things that it probably won't happen, um, you know, for that reason. But yeah, it'd be interesting, man, to, to see, uh, you know, I'd love to see John John do a couple more events, you know, e- even if it was Jaws or something like that. And, yeah. you know, that, that year that Walsh, uh, not Walshy, um, Josh Kerr yeah. decided to do the Jaws event. You know, it just, I think it just kind of, you know, it gets them excited too. The, the other, you know, WSL guys, seeing one of their guys competing on the on the big wave yeah. scene is, is really cool as well. That last Jaws event, was so ridiculous like was that almost the perfect storm of like having a contest the waves were insane i feel like the infrastructure to cover the event was there was do you think that was the first like real showcase of what the big wave tour could be i think the i think the size on that final day and the conditions and stuff for high performance big wave surfing was as good as it gets yeah you know like there was guys were legitimately getting barreled coming out um you know i had a 10 that Walsh, that Walsh, wave was Walsh, ridiculous she had a, Walsh, she had a 10 in that same semi yeah and then uh alby had some crazy ones too because he's sitting so much further inside you guys on those shorter boards huh yeah exactly yeah. um and, and so i mean yeah the performance level in that event was amazing you know yeah. but, but the waves were just allowed for it yeah um you know jaws is the best big wave in the world hands down there's no other wave that even comes close to it um so yeah i mean you know even if there was maybe another event there throughout the year mm. like two events Just there a couple and chances to it, get it, like that yeah there's so many different sort of avenues for it it's just unfortunate you know at the moment it's it's hard to come by you know dollars to put mm. these events on it, it's not like you know you, you package these things together you showcase it to a sponsor and they go, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Um, it's going to be held on this day, and you know, we're going to organise the live telecast. We're going to do all these things. We have that. We package that, and we put it put it down. And then they go, yeah, we'll sign off on it. But you need to guarantee it's going to happen. And mm. we go, well, we can't, can't guarantee anything. Mm. They're just like, well, you want us to put X amount of a million bucks or whatever it is to do an event, but you can't guarantee it's going to happen. They're just like. There's yeah. not many companies that are going to do that, yeah. you know. I can probably name one or two that that will and that are, but there's not a whole lot of others that will mm. that can pull that sort of shit off, you know. So, um, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see the big wave thing grow more for sure. I feel like there's such a big interest in it, but it's just dollars and cents. It's just it's a hard one. I know? think though, like when you really look at it, what you and Alby and Ian did in that semi is like, that's what needs to happen. Need, you, those kind of performances, like I watched that heat. I think I was actually at Red Bull um, in Santa Monica when that heat was going down. And like everyone was glued to the, the webcast. And it was just like everyone was having that like fuck off moment. Like this yeah. is this is really happening. And it looked so, like So are we. <laughs> yeah. oh, I can't even imagine. But it, it it looked like a Pipe Masters final. It, you know what I mean? It just had that like air of legitimacy of like this is it. This is as good like these dudes are doing what they want to be doing. Yep. And it's like the the conditions came together, the surfing was fucking out of control, like did Ian got that wave before you or did you get it before Ian? Like, cause he got a 10, you got a 10. Mate, uh, I got the first 10. Yeah. Okay. And then he got, I was like, yes, yeah, fucking yeah. 10 bang. Yeah. And, and cause I'm, I remember looking at that, that draw and going, holy, sorry. Yeah. I remember looking at that draw just thinking like, this could easily be a final. Oh yeah. And, um, and I'm thinking I'm going to have to put my, fucking a game on to get through this one like i haven't really been intimidated much in in you know i I don't really care about names and stuff but i looked at that that draw the night before and i started laughing i'm like are you fucking serious like (laughs) this is pretty stacked (laughs) and and i knew i was an underdog coming into that semi and uh and i kind of thought i was too to be honest you know um but I, i did back myself and and uh 
and I knew, you know, I had a good enough chance to, to win it. And um, yeah, if I knew, yeah, the, the strategy going into that was just, you know, I had actually some really bad wipeouts the day before. I had probably one of the worst wipeouts I've ever had. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. The day before was big, raw and... Because um, the conditions weren't as good that day, was it? They weren't as good, but it was big. Mm. You know, it, was, it was really kind of pretty sketchy conditions, real bumpy and um, kind of had to send it on one just to, to get through the heat. I had like at one score and then I had to send it on this on this really big one and um, end up going through like four canisters. I went through all my canisters Shit. in one wipeout. So like usually you fall off, you pull a canister and, and you're good, you come up. And I pulled my first canister it deflated because of the pressure i got like ragdolled like a car crash pulled the next one came up and there was a 20 footer like top to bottom 20 footer like literally broke like 20 meters in front of me so that's like basically an explosion it was bad it yeah was, yeah it was, it was... <laughs> that that would be my phone <laughs> you're right mate you're in demand yeah. we get it <laughs> um so 20 foot explosion yeah it was like what's it, like what's going through your head at that point like is anything going through your head do you have time to think you're just going fuck like, like, i was just like i was kind of like oh fuck that was bad you know like i just the actual wipeout itself was like oh then to get to shit. the surface got to the surface i was like kind of you're pretty rattled you know you get the surface and you're not stressing you're just kind of like in survival you yeah. know you're like you know I, I do a lot of training and shit like a lot of breath training and i know what to do to get to get the breath back and to to stay calm and it's just you know you just that clicks in yeah straight away you're just like okay this is what i gotta do to survive and get through it and then fucking hit and it's just like a it's it, it's pretty messed up like sometimes you kind of like it's so messed up that you actually almost start laughing you're like <laughs> is this fucking happening like i just got beach ball 20 meters in the air and uh and you kind of like because you kind of are a beach ball when you're fully inflated, fully inflated so it's yeah. like pushing you down and then you've got to come up oh yeah it's gnarly so you actually get air off the surface of the wave do you think like so once once that hits you it's not just pushing you down and then you smooth, oh, no. go smooth to the surface it's like you actually get flung from it yeah yeah you're, you're literally a beach ball like you feel like you're just getting kicked <laughs> you're like 20 20 meters it's out of control that's heavy and then sometimes you will hit and it will suck you back over and like it's tapped and uh yeah I, I knew i got really really fucked up when i pulled the first canister so it deflated pulled it another one and then finally started coming up i was fully inflated on the surface before that that 20 footer hit me the 20 footer hit me beach ball me deflated pulled the third one and it was starting to bring me up and then I was just that wigged out. I pulled the fourth, and that and that obviously broke the surface for me. But by that stage, I was I was on the, on the rocks. rocks. Yeah. So that's like, I don't know. That's uh, a football field um, of beatings, just especially on the north it. peak. You know, if you take off on that far north peak, not the inside, and you fall there, that's. I mean, it's every bit of nearly a minute of hold downs and beatings to the rocks. So pretty much everyone's doing the breath training stuff now. Like when when did that sort of come in? Do you reckon? I've been doing that for a long time. Um, what what was your first? Like how did you get onto that? <laughs> I nearly drowned. I well, I pretty much did drown. I um because I I haven't grown up with vests. You know. I was, yeah. So you yeah your pre vest era right? Yeah. So like yeah. How, how, well, what's the difference between a vest wipeout at Jaws and a no vest wipeout at Jaws? You wouldn't surf Jaws without a vest. You drown. So you didn't do that back in, like, no one was no surfing. one's No one surfed Jaws without, no one legitimately has surfed Jaws without a vest. So it's that gnarly that you don't think you could survive a wipeout there without a vest? That wipeout I just explained to you, I would have 100% drowned if I didn't have a vest. That's fucked up. Like, like, easy. Because what the vest does, it it only it brings you up, but it actually you actually get momentum to push you in. Yeah. Whereas if you haven't got a vest and you fall off, you're like a rock, and it just recycles you in the same spot and pushes you deep. Whereas when you're inflatable, it pushes you deep, but it pushes but, you f like yeah. towards with the energy. Whereas when you, without them, you just sink, and then, and then you you're obviously trying to fight your way to get the surface. But then you're in the in the like the 
perfect position for the next wave to be like literally on your head. Mm. And that's why like, you know, big wave surfing when I, f- you know, was getting into it younger was pretty tapped. Like yeah. guys were drowning frequently and, um, and like you go to Hawaii and you'd hear like horror stories. Like, you know, um, I remember hearing one off Shane and he's Shane Dorian when there's an outer reef there and he was like, yeah, two wave hold down and basically just was, he said, I, I pretty much drowned. Can't remember coming up and he got really smoked and, and that stuff was happening pretty frequently. Um, and, you know, even looking back at it now, I, uh, I'd see photos and footage of me just surfing in board shorts and, uh, like, I don't even think I'd do that now. Yeah, uh, right. Just like with it, the knowledge that you've got of the, like the, some of the big hold downs you've had with vests on. Oh yeah, exactly. And you know, like just looking at it, just going, fuck, what was I thinking? You know, surfing these waves without a vest. And that's when like, you know, I've gotten better at breast training now. Um, just purely because I like spearing and spear fishing and stuff yep. like that. Um, and I know how far I can push it, but it's, um, yeah, you wouldn't even consider surfing the ways we do now without a vest. So where was the near drowning thing that made you start looking into the breath thing? And then what was, um, what was like the, I guess what info was available then? Cause now I th- feel like Wim Hof's made the whole breath thing like super famous. And then you've got like Brian McKenzie doing his stuff uh led hamilton like a a ton of dudes like i feel like there's resources now so i kind of get the impression that when you started doing there almost wasn't like resources for the breath training stuff uh a lot of my breath stuff was through a guy called nam baldwin and uh he had a breath background um some free diving stuff and you know he kind of just catered a program more specifically for for you know guys that were surfing and um kind of was working with him for a long time and um you know we we were kind of tweaking things together and you know playing around with certain things and i um you know i've got a a thing now breath performance that i've been working on and and doing stuff myself working with another guy called james fletcher who he's uh basically basically come up with a uh program around a device that will strengthen your diaphragm and your inner costals which will allow for longer breath holds and um, will allow you to go past certain barriers when you start to obviously get huge urges your body will start to kick in if you've got a stronger diaphragm it will allow you to hold your breath or allow you to push your breath longer and stuff like that so um continuing continuing evolving that and doing my own stuff just because you know obviously i i know what it takes to to get through the, these hold downs and and um yeah so it's kind of just one of those things it's not really i enjoy it you know i, I enjoy trying to you know push that sort of envelope and you know it's um it's obviously an important part of surfing big waves but i mean now it's it's obviously a lot safer with the devices but i still try not to rely on rely that. on it because yeah. you know i have had them pop and stuff like that before yeah um a friend of mine jimmy um has got me onto the brian mckenzie's program um yep. have you seen his stuff uh, yeah i've done a seminar with him up in brisbane oh right yeah. yeah he's an interesting cat man yeah he is interesting he's um yeah yeah i feel like most uh i don't i don't want to come across too uh yeah they're very good at selling what yeah. they're doing yeah um it's not really groundbreaking stuff yeah um i don't think i mean it's just it's like you know if because if if you're in that that realm of stuff you understand yeah you've got more of an understanding than like the commercial level of it exactly they're kind of doing like the layman's sort of terms of it i guess yeah yogis and you know people yoga fire breathing and you know there's so many different types of things that are coming out that aren't that new really um you know if you know how to breathe um if you know how to breathe in your diaphragm you know to get lateral ex- expansion and um all that sort of stuff it's you know the wim hof stuff's obviously you know very different all, again um yeah. but yeah it's all stuff that's been around for a long time yeah yeah um so i guess what are like if you weren't big wave surfing like say for me right i'm not like a big wave surfer or like 
could barely even call myself a surfer really um but like what are some of the benefits because i know jimmy's like he loves the breathing stuff like he gets up and he does his like 15 minutes in the morning or whatever yeah and he's just like man it's just like a triple shot of coffee so i think like what are the benefits or like could you explain some of the benefits to just the everyday person to like starting their day with like some legitimate breathing exercises so james fletcher the guy i was saying before who's got a program around it, there's a device called the power breathe device it's basically it's very similar to like lifting weights to build muscle yeah it's doing the same thing with this breathing device which will allow a stronger diaphragm and inner costals which is obviously so the muscles, muscles around your ribs, ribs right? that yeah. will you know obviously allow a stronger diaphragm stronger diaphragm bigger breasts once you learn how to breathe properly it eliminates so many things you know high breath is stress you see a lot of guys with like curled over shoulders and they're not like good posture yeah. you know you can i can tell but just by looking at someone if they know how to breathe properly yeah and, right you know how they carry themselves and stuff like that um you kind of i can like like even eliminating back issues and stuff um you know through a lot of years of surfing and stuff you don't it's very hard to breathe properly down to your you know your your diaphragm and stuff it's a lot of high breathing so i was getting a lot of back issues so when you say high breathing are you you feel like you're sort of just breathing to your chest and not like filling up down here yeah if you fill up down here it's like an extra 30 percent there like i feel like yeah when i take deep breaths i feel like i'm tight across my chest and it will continue getting tighter too yeah because yeah like and i had the same issue too i thought you know yeah i'm breathing properly and and you know obviously working with you know james fletcher and and understanding how to get the most out of a proper breath with this machine because you can actually see the graph like you can see how much volume you're doing you know every single breath so when i first started doing it i was looking at the graph on the on the screen it's wrong he's like yeah you're not breathing properly you know you you you're losing out on 30 percent of your breath by not going down into the proper you know chambers and stuff like that and uh it was super interesting and and just from using that device and the program around it was like night and day this is kind of blowing my mind because i'm like sitting here going like fucking 30 years i've probably never taken a proper breath guaranteed that's heavy like how how many people could would go through their life not even knowing that the whole breathing is a thing because well not only that it's just like i thought that i'd and you're knew, an elite athlete oh, you know? I, I, that's what i was training for so for so long and i was just like oh my breath must be good you know I, i've got a long breath hold can you know you can do sets of 50 meters underwater with like a pretty high heart rate um but then because i was looking at this graph and it wasn't consistent and and you know his the program obviously focuses on it's just like a muscle you know like you know what's your high output you know what's your volume all these different things so once you see that on the screen you're like there's something wrong here i'm missing something Mm. so i I just kind of i had obviously a lot of things that were good but the fundamentals were kind of wrong and and so you know his whole thing is focused around um you know people that have had lung cancer and you know people that can't even walk up a flight of stairs because they get gassed um you know you've got to be in a weird spot like a like a bad spot health wise to to be in that kind of position eh? like that's a long road to get there yeah but this these this program that we're you know obviously trying to launch is is to help everyone Mm. it's not just targeted at elite sports people and there's programs now i went and saw a guy called chris prosser who's really good at you know if i get a yeah like a really serious injury or something like that he's he's always evolving his stuff and so what does he do so he's a he's a uh a chiro and physio yep and he's always doing new shit like the last time i saw him um you know it's like baby back to baby movements that incorporates the proper breathing that i'm talking about and because a lot of people's issues stem from switching off certain areas like lower chambers and and all that up I'm not amazing at explaining this sort of yeah, science no, behind yeah, it, yeah. but basically it's bringing back movements that you first done when you learn how to walk and crawl, but back to 
the right habits of breathing around those movements which switch those right muscles on so if you say lift something or you do something incorrectly obviously that's going to stem certain pinches and impingements in your back and stuff like that so his whole thing is around like i don't know the exact name of it but it's like um really basic uh movements that babies and stuff do and yep. correlating that with the breath to allow it to switch back on yeah it's it's tapped it's pretty crazy yeah it's definitely something that i want to get into and i know um like you've been to p3 right yeah yeah so yeah. i was at p3 the other day for the first time doing their ice bath therapy yep and like me i haven't looked into it at all in depth enough or practiced or whatever but i was um so you start with the 18 degree which is pretty cold like yep. you're gonna um for anyone that's on the gold coast listening you should go to p3 even if you're not doing sports stuff or anything like that just to experience the whole ice bath ice hot kind of therapy it's epic because i think that i mean your body feels amazing um as a result of it anyway that they have magnesium in the baths um so i mean there's fringe benefits to it but i think that nothing will make you um think about how important breathing is than standing in an ice bath for four minutes because you're so i was kind of really trying to like breathe as deep as i could um to get myself like i guess like full of oxygen because based on the wim hof thing he yep. basically says like you it's, know you want to oxygenate all your cells and it's almost hyperventilating yeah, yeah basically and you get like lightheaded you feel yeah. kind of dizzy and stuff from it eh? yeah yeah exactly um but well, i definitely was still cold, he's trying so. to ex- he's trying to expel a lot of co2 and stuff like that yeah over oxygenate the body and yeah that's why you feel that lightheadedness yeah yeah because anytime like if you've been on an oxygen ventilator like you get kind of a bit woozy from that because yep. what we breathe isn't a no. lot, like the, there's not a crazy high percentage of oxygen in the air that we breathe no no it's it's carbon dioxide as well you know it's yeah yeah and that's why when you do a lot of my training is hypoxic training with high heart rate which is basically you know dealing with co2 build up which is that feeling that you're like oh that feels shit i want to breathe now yeah um that's the that's exactly what you kind of go through when you have a wipeout it's kind of like you don't get to breathe, to breathe up yeah you know and so a lot of my stuff is is training around that feeling yeah um which isn't always that obviously that fun but it's realistic and and it's necessary for what you're putting your body through for sure yeah but yeah with the the p3 thing um so yeah you got your 18 degree then you go into i think it's 38 degrees so you go cold hot and then basically um we're getting trav in to he's going to talk about some of the science behind it which i'm yeah. pretty interested in but um then you jump into the 10 degree bath and they're like throwing ice like ice cubes at you while you're in it kind of thing like it's legitimately cold yeah and the instinct is to tighten up everything gets tight as like this deep do you, did you first get that when you first did it you sort of you stand there and you're tired and and that just makes it harder to breathe and the only time it felt bearable for me was when i just put my hands on the edge fully relaxed my body yeah and started taking these smooth breaths and that's when i stopped shivering and i kind of got some control over my body but then every time i went back in i just went back to that square one of like everything was tight it felt like i couldn't breathe and then it's this mental challenge to like let your body relax so that you can start taking normal breaths again. Yeah, it, it, that's exactly right. And I feel like that Wim Hof stuff is important. I, I feel like it's smart how he's kind of based a lot of his stuff around the ice baths because it it actually forces you, like you said, to focus on your breath. Yeah. Um, it was interesting because I, I have been doing a lot of the ice baths and heat you know heat as well and you don't necessarily have to do wim hof just because you're going in an ice bath yeah you know i i got just as good as a result on doing the same sort of recovery breaths that i do when i train as what um someone that was next to me trying to do the wim hof technique yeah i had I, in all honesty i, I actually felt it was more of a benefit so like your form slow, of training slowing the breath down and being relaxed um and just nasal um, inhalation and exhalation instead of just trying to do the Wim Hof, yeah. you know, um, technique. It, it it was you know obviously they both worked. 
Yeah, I guess it's just but the. I guess it just goes to show that the breathing is what's important in terms of controlling exactly. your body. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and mental too. I mean, uh, if you can control your, you know, the mental state. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> well, we like, took um, we took Jackson Richardson in. Jats is a two time Supercross champ, and he's just a he's an athlete. Like he's so fit and really strong, and um, like he's an gnarly dude in what he does. And we went through two rounds of it. And then they said, you know, recommend doing three rounds. And then we sort of said, fuck, we'll just do the first two and we'll hop out. Then I got to that hot one and I was like, nah, we're doing it. Like, yeah. we're just getting back in that ice bath. And um, and I think it was, it just is like, I guess it's just a good mental exercise in terms of just being a fucking bit of a savage. And like, I think that once you... Not that having an ice bath is savage, but what your instinct is, is to not do that. And then you do it and then you're like, okay, you got to do it again. And you're like, well, I don't want to do that. Like, it's very, very uncomfortable. And I think one, if you can get into a rhythm of doing things that your mind and body is rejecting and pushing back at you for, then it's almost, you know, whether you're an athlete or not, like that is a very useful skill to have is to look something in the face, the water's sitting right there. It's not moving. You could not get in it just as easy as you could get in it, but it's that's that pushback and then you're, you're overcoming it. Oh, for sure. I feel like, you know, there's so many things in this world now that are made easy, you know, mm. like, and for me, I've always tried to push myself to be uncomfortable be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation like you know whether it's breath hold stuff you know recovery ice bar stuff um when i train you know obviously the hypoxic training is is obviously you know all that sort of stuff um is training your body to be relaxed when shit hits a fan yeah and, and if you can do that then you know that that's the goal you know it's not like oh geez i look amazing but I'm not really mentally strong because I haven't pushed myself in certain areas or, yeah. you know what I mean? Like there's only certain things that you can do that, that, you know, take you to that place. But, you know, it also takes the right individual as well, you know? Yeah. Um, there's so some much. Peop- some people hate being uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, for Fucking sure. hate man. it. For like, sure. <laughs> it's such a, well, the thing is, is like you don't have to be. Yeah. You know exactly. You've mean? got that choice. You've got, we've got yeah. a choice now. And I think that, there's so much clarity for me like i'll do motocross stuff and like um yeah like i'll go surf i'll i'll paddle out on like big days that i i know i can't really i don't really have the cash in the bank to write that check in terms of surfing the waves but i'll go out there on big days just to get a beating yeah exactly and then i because i feel like so for example last time i was in the states it um have you you know like porto the beach at manhattan beach there like the, you got that jetty el porto yeah yeah i do so, like I that do. gets pretty heavy there and like we got a for for la obviously like we're we're talking there's levels to <laughs> yeah. the game but like for me it was probably you know a few foot overhead when you're at the base of the waves and there was no one out and it was like dusk there was i was by myself it was overcast the water was black i was fucking freezing cold and my mate was, who's a really good surfer. It's just like, ah, oh, nah. Like he was a bit crook and we yeah. knew Malibu was going to be really good the next day. Yeah. And I was like, fuck it. I'm going out, man. And he's kind of like <laughs> laughing on the beach and he sat in the back of his truck and watched me. And I just got exploded on for like... Like me jumping on a 450, trying to do a jump or something like that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the same. But, um, but like, I, I, it, I hated it when I was out there and I was scared when I was out there because everything was a closeout and like when you're not a good surfer and it's that big and everything's closing out, I was on a fish, like I wasn't even on the right board, but I just like wanted to put myself in that, like you said, that uncomfortable situation. Yeah. I wasn't exactly comfortable in that uncomfortable situation, but it's like I did it and I felt better from doing it. Doing it. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. I, you know, I got rolled around and then we went out to Malibu the next day and it was a little bit smaller, but way cleaner. And I just, I had a really good surf because I just felt, the confidence from putting myself through something like i it's almost like i could look back and be like well yesterday was fucking way harder everything that happened you was, probably enjoyed you know, it more though than sitting out malibu and 
Hanging, it was hanging tan with about a thousand other people. <laughs> well, we went to like a county line, right? So it's it's kind of good there because you can. There's like so many different peaks. It's not like a point that everyone's got to kind of sit on. Yeah, but it was fucking sketchy, dude. There was a dead seal, and it oh, just wow. kept floating like right next to me, and I just paddle away from this seal. It's like everywhere I went, this dead seal was there. Well, Lisa, Lisa Shark will attack the seal, hopefully. Instead Who knows, of you, though, you know. <laughs> you're rolling the dice. Up close and personal. <laughs> but this thing just legitimately would not fuck off, eh? But it, the good thing about it is that me and Nick got to like where whatever peak that seal was on. No you're on the other was, one. No, no one oh, else right, was on it. Yeah. <laughs> so we sat on the we sat where the seal was pretty much the whole time. And because uh, yeah, everyone else cleared off. And I was sort of like trying to justify it a little bit, running through my head like, ah, the shark will eat that instead of me. But fuck, it's still sketchy when there's just a dead seal and seagulls are landing on it and there's shit moving in the water all around it. I was like, oh, fuck this. <laughs> or, or for a two-foot wave. No, nah, yeah. it was like, it was pretty, well, two-foot yeah. for you. But it was decent for me. We had a good day that day. Eight-foot Cali. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what, yeah, you go to Hawaii. Well, yeah. you get... um. There's a dude that works for Red Bull Trav and he's a Hawaiian guy. He's yeah. Like a shredder. And then I always downplay it though. Like yeah, he'll be like, well, I'm like, oh, how was it at the beach today? He's like, oh, it's two foot, bro. Like, it's okay. Yeah. And I get out there. It's, it's like 12. Yeah, it's like a foot overhead. I'm like, it's yeah. firing, bro. He's like, nah, bro, it's two foot. Get back, getting back to that question that we're on before, though, um, about doing stuff that you're uncomfortable with. I, f- I feel like that's kind of the biggest draw card with surfing bigger waves because a lot of times throughout my career i've looked at it and i'm like why do i do this you know yeah. and sometimes you you know having a family and stuff you kind of got to look at that and go you know you've really got to look at what you're doing and kind of weigh the options up of is it worth keep you know is it worth pursuing or you know what's the risk versus rewards and does it make sense well you know and what's f- funny um sorry to cut you yeah. off there but Je- we had jeff weatherall and he's a base jumper yeah and like i wondered uh like i guess comment on this with what we're talking about with jeff is like are you making that call is like your ego involved to where you just want to be the dude surfing the biggest waves or like are you doing it for for that kind of true right reason when i was younger it was 100 percent ego yeah right for sure it was and i and I, it got to a point where i didn't want to surf big waves anymore i was kind of done and i literally had to reevaluate the whole thing on why i done it and it it's been a long process you know like um i feel like a lot of you know some people just that's all they want to do you know and surfing big waves to them isn't that scary and and stuff like that but for me you know big waves scare me you know they've always scared me but i feel like that's kind of helped me stay in the game for a long time and you know not drown not die you know, not get too injured, having a career-ending um, injury and stuff like that. But yeah, it's it's hard because when you're young, I feel like it is a bit of an ego-driving thing. You know, you want to out, you know, you want to outdo your friend. You want the you want you want the big, mag and you want the biggest wave. Yeah, and like to the point, you know, I was probably that bad to the point where you know it was personal. Like I made it personal. Like I got pissed if I wasn't on the biggest wave. You know, or um yeah i was willing to take it to any lengths really i I didn't even really give a shit if i died to be honest when i was younger i was like who gives a shit like it's (laughs) it wasn't a good place to be and it was pretty dark um and do you think like like i wonder dudes that like i got a lot of friends that do crazy shit and i know them personally and i know there's some demons there and there's some stuff that they're they've got going on and i i wonder sometimes is like are you doing this to run from the demons mm. and is that giving you is that filling the hole that you've got or is it masking the putting real shit on it. yeah putting yeah. a band-aid on it and then that's why when you kind of get in that attitude of like well fuck it i'll die for this is because you kind of are running from the things that you haven't really figured out in your life yet for sure 100 percent. and i'm the first one to admit that you know, I went through a stage where, like, personally, I, I it was hard. You know, I was like, it it wears you down. Like, you get to a point, you're like, fuck, I've had enough. And I can't and do keep doing like this. The, do you mean the, the actual physical act of the surfing or, like, the industry and sponsors and competitions Everything. and just the whole package? The whole thing, yeah. You just, yeah, it's just like, you're not 
doing it for the right reasons. Like you, you, you are, but you're not. You kind of like you. You can only feed off that sort of energy for so long until you burn yourself out. Yeah, you know what I mean. And then you've got to kind of look at it and go, "Why am I doing this? You know, is it worth risking and going this hard? Or you know, there's so many different things that that you mentally have to go through. And you know, re-evalu- reevaluating yourself outside surfing. You know, and, and you know, I think having a family for me was the big turning point. Um, you know, once you see your daughter and you realize you've got so much more to lose and, you know, sponsorship isn't everything. There's so many bigger things out there, mm. you know, like giving back and helping people is, you know, for me at this point in my career is, is such a, a amazing feeling. Um, and when you're younger, you're so caught up in your own shit. You don't really see that stuff. You know, you're like, I can sponsorship uh best video clip biggest wave like you're loving people giving you these props but it's not you know i feel like i never really enjoyed it i didn't get a chance to actually take it all in because Mm. you're in such a like a a frenzy frenzy that you're like you know what i mean like you're not even really there you're not present in the moment going oh how good's this Mm. and i feel like in the last four years five years even like I've been able to kind of like slow down and kind of, you know. Um, like smell the roses a bit. Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel like I'm actually enjoying those moments, you know. I won't be, you know, if I see a swell that's like maxing out at ship turns and I know it's like borderline rideable, I won't even go. Like I don't give a shit if someone's like, where were you? It was the biggest day. And, you know, like I already know that it's going to be borderline too big. Mm. And it's like, it's not worth it. So it's like, it's like you're steering the ship now as opposed to that ego side of things. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, you don't, it is what it is. You know, you're in charge of your own destiny, not, you know, this, yeah, coming from this other place that is not a good position to be in. Yeah. And I think people, people pick up on that too, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, Yeah, for sure. Yeah. People can see it, you know, like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's dark it's not it's not a fun place to be in and i I think that i mean people get there whether it's with athlete like as an athlete or like it's i think there's i don't know it's like it's like you sort of have to go through that thing in your late 20s some people never get out of it and then they'll be you know career fuck-ups in terms of you know they might yeah yeah. because it's like you can people turn to alcohol drugs like i mean it's just endless you know really because i think that the um the whole like everyone's got demons everyone's got baggage everyone's got a thing that they've got to deal with because the past is a bit of a motherfucker in that Mm. way and there's things that happen that are like out of your control that are shitty things and you know what i mean like you look at a guy like barney miller like his podcast just coming out today and it's like dude had every reason to just say fuck this yeah you know that's a shit hand to get dealt and you know then that's the thing that you carry into the future like the the baggage of your past is that thing that kind of carries and i I think that you know for your side of things it's like you you're always in this competitive um realm where you're like constantly measuring yourself against other people and then you get into this like battle of self-worth almost eh? where it's like your self-worth is tied to that biggest wave or that best clip or and it's like there's a your identity is almost held hostage by how good you can surf. Exactly. And then you only really know yourself when you look, when it's been stripped back, you know, and, and you're like, okay, now I've got to hustle. Now I've got to make something happen. And, you know, you aren't getting free handouts. And, and it's kind of like, that's when the real you comes out. You know, that's when your character comes out. That's when you, you're not taking stuff for granted and you're kind of like making shit happen and you're doing things. For the, you have to do things for the right reasons because... It just doesn't work otherwise, you know. And um, you know, I, I'm I'm stoked with where things are at for me at the moment. Yeah, like obviously, you know, I've, I've I just lost Monster, which was pretty heavy. Um, like that was probably like eight years with that brand, and and they were like the hand that fed me. And uh, but you know, every loss, there's always something to gain from that, you know. And and I'm looking at so many different other opportunities now that have opened up and. And I'm excited, you know, and, and I'm, you know, obviously 
I'll always surf, you know, waves and, you know, obviously big waves is what, you know, I, I really enjoy when I feel like it. And, uh, you know, Jaws last year was just so sick. Mm. You know, like I was frothing to do that. And, um, you know, so just those, that sort of, those sort of moments are, are special, you know. Yeah, and I think that, like, when you get in a place where you kind of can enjoy them and it's not, like, you know, the only... You're not living for that moment, I guess. Like, you've got yeah, other exactly. stuff to live for. Because I've found... I got into a place where I was doing a lot of, like, really cool shit. And I was like... I remember just being like, just couldn't wait to leave a shoot with like a dude that I looked up to my whole life. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm like, but not because like, so like Ricky Carmichael, that yes. guy's like, he's one of my best friends of like, I'll talk to him all the time. I love that dude. Like he was my idol growing up. Yeah. Like it is such a weird place where like I'm at his house filming a commercial Yeah. and it's like the coolest shit ever. And I'm like looking at the clock and I'm like, because well, you had something else. that No, was- like I just think, you know, you get into that, complacent and kind of yeah and you're not like you said you're not smelling the roses you're just yeah. caught up in all this other shit in your head and it's like you if you really strip back and you're like at you're like hey man at the core of this you got into this because you watched this guy your whole life yeah oh, i think everyone you know, goes yeah. through it, you know like yeah like I, i'm sure you yeah. could have been sitting at pipe and it's like one of the most fucking epic days ever it's like perfect waves and you're just like pissed because something peripheral happened and it like fully takes you out of the moment when if you're like if you could look at yourself through like a video game lens you'd be like slap Fuck, this guy <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean like look at how look at what you've got to be stoked for, oh, for and sure. even down to like you could strip it back to like well i'd give anything to get a wave a pot like one wave just feel that thing you know what i mean so it's like you can you can um i guess it's like if you put all your you know the problems in your life and then you looked at it with compared to everybody else you'd probably go oh fuck like no i've got it i've got it pretty good (laughs) i'll I'll take a step back but yeah yeah, i think like you said everyone gets into those times where that momentum you just get so caught up where like if you really looked at it you're like fuck it's pretty sick yeah yeah exactly i've more so yeah like if you like i said before you know like if you look at what you have and you scale everything back and you just like we got it pretty good, pretty solid. Yeah, it's yeah, like, it's, it's hard. We're not we're not living in a third world country. We've got heaps of opportunities, and you know, um, especially in Australia. I mean, you know, you can get paid to not even friggin' work. Yeah, basically, <laughs> it's you know that security is pretty gnarly. I'd, I mean, I'd never go there, but um, we are we are lucky for sure. Yeah, let going back to like that first kind of deal at Pipe. Do you? remember like how scared you were like even did you have fear of like when you went to bed and you could hear the waves and knowing you'd have to get up like and kind of go because you're in a heavy crew like jb's out there and he's not scared i think it was just like when you're so when you throw yourself in so deep and you're so excited and you've kind of visualized yourself doing it for so long as a kid and it's a dream and you're actually playing it out it's almost more excitement than fear, you know. I feel like later in your career, you get more scared because you actually know what you're you've in felt for. The consequences. You, you've fallen on that reef. You've hit the bottom. You've had injuries. Like you're like, this is a real deal, you know. This place is no joke. Um, and then there's a, a bit of pressure on you to perform, and that's when more fear, I think, creeps in. But those initial first, you know, yeah, obviously I shit myself, but it was like excitement and shitting myself too, you know? It wasn't yeah. just like... Like anticipation more than fear. Yeah, like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm actually here and doing this, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was just fun, you know? It was, um, it was just like a first time sort of moment where everything was, it was happening. It was just... yeah. yeah it was good do you remember the first legit wave that you kind of finished at pipe and got spat out i remember the first proper wave that i got at pipe and i i couldn't have blown it any harder if i tried (laughs) oh really yeah and the thing like literally the thing just came straight to me it was like a proper roll and i was right behind it it's like here man yeah and i just come off the bottom i remember the guy that i was there with um from home which was he was a bit older he's seen the whole wave and i remember looking when i when i stood up and went to grab morale and i've never gone so got pushed so fast down a wave 
And I remember looking at him for some reason, I just locked eyes with him and he was in the <laughs> channel. <laughs> and I just froze like a deer in headlights. Yeah. And I just, I couldn't pull up to get in it. And I just went straight. And when I went straight, I thought, yeah, I've outran it. I'm good. The way it's broken, it's good. The thing literally landed on the back of my board and just threw me and cartwheeled me. And I remember just doing like five cartwheels, sucked over the falls, hit the bottom, but I was fine. Like I didn't get injured. And I paddled back out and my mate was just like hands on the head. Go, what the fuck are you doing? You just <laughs> blew the best wave of the morning. I was just, oh. And I remember looking and just going, yeah, I did. Like I literally just like all I did is pull up and I would have just got the most amazing barrel. But I was so freaked out and it was just too much and yeah. just panicked. And, just the overload. Yeah. And I just got creased and that was. That was my first wave at Pipe, legit wave. And uh, yeah, obviously, I, I do remember the first couple of waves I got out there and I just, it was just always so big. You know, yeah. every, everything was just, there's so much room. I just remember that, you know. But yeah, pretty amazing, amazing place. So what was your, you obviously grew up with like intentions of being on the, like the, actual ct yeah when did that focus sort of shift to going in the big wave sort of surfing when i wasn't getting the results i was pretty shit in smaller waves and and a lot of the competitions were in small waves yeah um i had quicksilver at the time and that was when the crossing just started and they sort of gave me the opportunity to chase the free surfing route and got invited on some really cool trips and you know obviously they they had a house over there at the time and we just kind of they they just could see that i was better at, at you know the big wave stuff the, the big wave stuff and free surfing and and then it just kind of evolved from there and the waves got bigger and I came home and realized that we've got some of the craziest waves in the world in, in my backyard in australia and and that's when you know i i had I think I was around 18, 19 when I first went down to Ship Cerns and it was really publicized place, you know, like um, one of the heaviest, craziest waves on the planet. And I was like, well, you know, I'm spending a lot of time in Hawaii. I may as well give it a crack. And I remember the first time I went down there and it was just like still to this day, one of the best, best like the best days I've ever seen there. Mm. And um, end up surfing with like two other guys out I was there with Kobe Abenham when you know when he was in his prime, surfing those sort of waves a lot, and mm. uh, it was crazy. End up getting one of the best waves of my life, and first surf out there was um, got second in uh, the ride of the year. Oh, and really? that kind of yeah, that kind of started the the whole big wave surfing. Career. And then that that was almost I guess like a bit of a light bulb moment. I was like, okay, yeah, this can be my thing now. Yeah, I don't think I had a choice then. It was like yeah you know i was shit in small waves i couldn't qualify so if i wanted to surf for a living you know that was my that was my calling you know that was where i had to go and i was willing to do anything it took to uh to surf for a living just keep the dream alive keep the dream alive how (laughs) heavy of a dude is kobe um yeah yeah he's yeah he's on he was pretty full on yeah he's uh yeah he, he was always really nice to me and stuff like that but i'm you know i'm sure he could throw his weight around when he wanted to and stuff, but yeah, I, I think I think the whole image of that got a bit blown, blown out. out. Yeah, yeah, I think um, he's probably like an example of what I was talking about of a guy that's just running from demons, and it's like if the wheels fall off while he's doing it, then so be it. Yeah, but that's yeah. obviously from a super outside perspective. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Because um, he just seems like he's not scared of anything no not back like back then yeah he was he was pretty a pretty gnarly dude like especially in those sort of waves you know like he was considered like the craziest guy in the in those slab waves and like he had the send button and you just press it whenever he wanted yeah well yeah that's like that whole crew like mark matthews and kobe and and that whole sydney crew around the cape slander wave yeah um that's where you know surfing in big waves and in australia we were considered you know like slab guys so slab waves are obviously waves that break on pretty much nothing nothing and uh it's really unique because nowhere else in the world has waves like that and um so is australia that unique for slabs like that you don't oh, yeah, really find them that where 
And what do you, what do you think that is? Just the way our coastline is with like that that super deep water to exactly. then just like those that almost like continental shelf, right? Yeah, exactly. Like a lot of our waves go from you know 40, 50 meters deep to like a 12, 15 foot shelf, and, and you know obviously ship turns. It's you know you got the Atlantic. Uh, big storms coming in from you know way up the top that scoop down and uh, they get some of the biggest swells in the world and and then all that you know all that energy energy is focusing straight on this small shelf and the same as you know down south um western australia the place called the riot yeah you know that's what uh, you know big wave surfing was when i grew up is that we're surfing these waves that were never really surfed they haven't they've only been surfed you know when i first surfed them for probably you know eight ten years before that or not even you know and so it was really fresh like people just didn't think it was achievable to surf these spots and you know i had friends that found that place called the right and it was it's the biggest craziest scariest wave in the world and yeah um, so that's the one that you rate is that's the king kong of slabs yeah yeah for sure i mean it doesn't get any bigger crazier than that wave and and so, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that we learned along the way, uh, Way you know, we didn't have the inflatable vest yeah. surfing that sort of spot. And, you know, that's where I had that near drowning and uh, we we're, so we're just using deep... wakeboard vest to yeah, try to come right. up. And how then... deep is the right there for you to almost drown? Like it's deep, obviously deep enough to where you'd, you'd want a vest. Not oh, like for sure. Because yeah. hey, what's the depth like compared to jaws because is jaws deeper like it breaks in deeper water um yeah so before our before <coughs> our interruption we we're talking about the the right and the way that it breaks like the water versus jaws so you're saying jaws is oh like yeah kind of gradual yeah so the the shelf at jaws is is gradual whereas the right's obviously like it's 40 50 meters deep comes in hits this crazy shallow shelf which allows a wave just to go square you know and um the thing with it though is that because it goes deep straight after the shelf um what i figured out <laughs> was that when you fall if you get washed over the back ledge of it it, oh. it starts to spin you get these crazy like turbine things underwater you know like yeah wild and so i fell off on a wave and was literally pinned on the shelf and i pushed up and started running off it because i was like flat and i didn't want to stay on the shelf so i started running and i literally ran off the back of the ledge it was like felt like base jumping or something i jumped and it was the worst thing i could have done because when i got off the so shelf you jumped off the back i got dragged off it like put the pressure was pushing down on me and i was i got to my feet i, I didn't i felt like I didn't want to stay on the shelf for some reason in case there was another one behind it that hit directly and where I you was. Got smushed onto it pretty much. Yeah, exactly. It just would have been a bad spot to be in. So I just ran off the back of the ledge. I didn't really know where I was. I just knew that I was on a dry shelf. So I just ran and it pushed me off the back. And I felt like I literally just jumped off a cliff. And then I just started getting sucked down into these fucking crazy, like, turbine jet things underwater that were just pushing me further down and further down to the point where i knew i was deep because i had to equalize like three times you know so what's that like 30 feet or it was or no, meters? no no yeah that's yeah. like no, 30 so it's like meters. 10 meters right per yeah roughly yeah roughly yeah and so i knew i was deep because i i can i've got a max dive depth when i go spearing of like i can do 25 all day but if I go 30, like I'm pretty, I can get pretty gassed, you know? Yeah. Like, and I can't stay down there for that long, which is pretty long, um, you know, pretty deep. And uh, and so I knew I was deep when, you know, I, I had to equalize that many times and I was already kind of pushed on the bottom of the shelf. And that's, you know, and then we just had these, you know, jet pilot inflatable things that we used to wear that foam, you know, they weren't like proper air yeah, tags. Yeah, just like, like a wakeboard vest. Exactly and uh so they didn't really do all that much you know and so yeah it was gnarly i got i had to kind of fight my way to get up to the surface or get further towards the surface and get instead of getting spun down because i was under for two waves and then i just kept grabbing these like these things to try to push myself up so to were go you the right like direction. close to the ledge i got pushed off the back of the ledge so i had no idea where i was i'm just oh, so, I, but, so what were you grabbing 
So obviously underwater, when you fall off, I keep saying obviously like you should know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, last time yeah. I said it, right, I just fucking nailed every wave. So. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so when you fall off, you try to kind of like direct yourself like you were swimming or doing breaststroke. You, if you use your hands, you go in the right direction. Yeah. So you can kind of do that underwater when you fall off. You know, you, there's a lot of oh, water so you're moving. Like, you're knowing so you're trying where to, north is, so you're trying to just... Yeah, I, I kind of knew where the north, surface... Yeah. I know where the surface is in that direction because I've got my vest trying to bring me up a bit. I'm trying to go with it and trying yeah. to fight to get to the surface. Yeah. And because I was so deep, I had to do that because it kept... Like, I'd gain sort of momentum coming up and then if I got it wrong and or if another surge came over on top of me, it just pulled me back down. And yeah. I've done that like two, three times. And I literally, at, on the third one, I just stopped swimming. I'm like, I'm done. I'm going to black out. And then finally, I felt like everything started settling down. I knew that there was a break yeah. in, the, in, in, the, in the waves or, you know, because I'd already copped. I fell on probably the second, set, second wave of the set. And I knew there was probably like four waves in the set. I got another one on the head, which was obviously pulling me back down a lot underwater. And then when it started calming off, I knew that I could, you know, by the third time of getting dragged back down, that I could. Yeah, you figured that was, I, I the figured set was over. That was it. You know, this is my moment to get up. But at that stage, I was already gassed. You know, I was like, shit's getting in pretty the red bad. Zone, yeah. So I started swimming up. I got started getting good momentum. Probably done like 15 strokes like slow long strokes which is a lot and then the body started convulsing bad really yeah like really bad to the point where i was like when your body goes through that so what exactly is happening there that's your body like that's not you that's not you freaking it's not dying it's just running out of air it's running out of oxygen so it's like um that's where your diaphragm will kick in because if you've got a strong diaphragm what will happen your body It'll like make you breathe, right? It'll make you breathe. Like yeah. you, like I was getting to the point where my my mouth I had shut, but I was sucking water in without like mindfully doing trying it. to do it. Fuck that! And so like at one point I was literally like holding my mouth because I was starting to suck a fair bit of water in, and then the convuls the convulsions I had at the start were. I over I probably overrode like one, and then the second one I started taking the water. I knew by the third, like by the three, because I I'd train like I'd get like one urge and convulsion, and then like maybe two. By the third, like I never really pushed it past two. You know, like two was like oh you know that that's pushing it a bit. So I knew after the second one, and the water was starting to thin. So I kind of got it like a bit of a mental sort of like oh yeah I'm I'm. I must be getting close. And that's when I knew I was deep because I, I felt the change of the water pressure. Yeah, like the actual pressure of and, the water on your Yeah, body, on my yeah. face. Like yeah. I could feel it. And yeah. like it, things were getting more airy. Like, and it's like, okay, I must be getting pretty close. But that could still be 10 meters. That could be still 10 yeah. meters. So I was like, don't get too excited. Like, and then by this stage, because I thought I was going to drown like, I don't know, 15 strokes ago, I was like, I'm still here. I'm still like conscious. But then, like, the th- when the third one kicked, I don't remember breaking the surface. Yeah. And I just came up right next to my mate on the ski. It was just like, I couldn't even jump on the ski because I was like... You're gone pretty gone, much. Gone, yeah. Like, yeah. I've yeah. got photos of it, actually, this guy. This photographer was right there on a ski, and I literally, where I fell off was where I came up. So I'd done a whole circle of the whole reef really bizarre like almost to like where you let go of the rope at the start of the race so i went around the whole thing came up and i was just like yeah we did rattled. were you pretty conscious when you came like you didn't lose consciousness or uh it's it was like i don't really remember the last bit of it and i was starting to swim sideways so i knew i was getting i was on weird. the urge yeah. of blacking out yeah and then when i broke the surface i just remember like like kind of i knew i was at the surface but i wasn't coherent like i yeah. couldn't i couldn't do much and yeah then, you're just that that done and it took me like a you know i don't know four or five breaths to like yeah okay i'm good i can like move is it almost like um have you ever been pro- properly put to sleep in jiu-jitsu yeah 
Is it almost I'm not in class, but I've like my mates, just like mates and shit. Like, yeah. Is it almost like that where you sort of like uh, you, even you're about to tap and then you just go like you just sort of you just drip, but you think you're there, but you're sort of not there. I think it's obviously like, it's a yeah, way more extreme yeah, version, it's, but it's like that last little bit where you actually think, yeah, you think you're all good and you can like. Yeah, it, I've like had like reach to like tap somebody's leg and you just like like in the middle of it and you you just think you're there the whole time. Yeah, I it's uh it's probably a bit it's not as abrupt like it's not like Doesn't oh, come I'm on here that quick, yeah. and you're gone you know yeah. like you know that you're about to go you, you know, like things start happening the body's like giving you so many warning signals like <laughs> breathe what bro are what are you doing <laughs> like yeah there's bells and whistles going off everywhere but um so if it was yeah. like a car dash it'd just be lit up oh yeah the things just going <laughs> ham it's like fuck what's going check, on check oil uh, check oil <laughs> Tire pressures are gone. Yeah, everything's Fuel going. Fuel lights on. Yeah, the steering starts shaking. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! I just can't. Like when you were telling that story, like I've had one sketchy moment surfing where like it was just really big and it was dark. I couldn't get a wave in. I got exploded and then I got held down for two waves down in San Diego at Blacks. Yep, yep. And I was on the bottom there and. I can't like for what I would have been feeling and like the situation I was in compared to that. Yeah. For how like I come up so rattled from that situation, like to go through what you went through. Like I'm in my mind when you're telling that story, I'm like going back to that day at Blacks and I'm yeah. just like, whoa. Yeah, it was um like even for me I was like, yeah, it was it kind of rattled me for a while. But um it's all part of it and that was that was probably the worst one that I've had for sure so was that uh, then like a bit of a turning point for you to like get super deep into the whole breath training side of it oh for sure yeah so it's like, almost like a blessing in disguise really for sure yeah you know like you gotta learn from your you know your ex, you know your experiences and i learned from that one and i just wanted to be a weapon at holding my breath yeah and um and so obviously that was a huge part of the training and stuff that i that i do and but like in all honesty man you um you get better the more wipeouts you have you know the more crashes you have the better you get at them yeah but you just don't want to have them too much um especially you know when they're that bad especially too like you're gonna have in any sport in any discipline of i guess doing something with any risk it's not if it's when so i guess you can't be naive to the risk and go like oh fuck i just won't crash because like that's not your choice Oh, you have to crash. Yeah. And the crazy part about, I feel the crazy part about extreme sports as a whole is that when does it end? You know, like oh. I feel like the levels get pushed so much to the point where like, I don't know where you go from there, you know, like, and, and but they do. It Are keeps you feeling evolving. that in surfing now? Um. Yeah, I feel like that yeah. was a thing until you guys started paddling and then it's almost like there was a barrier and then you did start paddling jaws and doing the paddle stuff and yeah. now it's like a whole new thing again to where it like resets well, to where you're like, well, how far can this go? Well, yeah, exactly. And even for me, you know, like I definitely feel like I'm not the young guy anymore. Like I'm, I'm in that sort of older realm and there's young guys coming through that I look at and I'm like, whoa. Like who this. are some of those young kids on the radar you reckon? uh there's a brazilian kid who just won the nazare contest um he's he's gnarly he's probably like he's the sort of guy that i look at and he's just like like he's not scared to die yeah one bit he's doing stuff that he's kind of back where you guys were yeah yeah but, Isn't but that even like like more more like isn't it crazy that it's like you kind of maybe this is what it is is to where it's like you get that wave right and then the levels at here and then you get a group of guys that that go through that ego transition into that self-awareness transition and then it slows down for them and then when the bar's been here then you get those kids that come up and they're driven by ego and then it's like that ego not scared to die can take it to here yeah. and then they hit that self-awareness button for sure and then they're like fuck i don't know how much further i can go and then that next generation of kids comes along and then it's like it's sort of you've got to be in that not scared ego phase to kind of push the limit yeah exactly and i feel like extreme sports that realm that we're talking about that young push like reckless realm is like 
that's the realm that will stay relative to push the sport yeah. and that older sort of like wise guy i feel like might get a bit push more pushed out yeah in, in the, i'm talking like the future of yeah. extreme sports i feel like the time frame of you in that extreme sport and pushing that sport will be limited a lot more yeah and it won't be such a long period um because of how hard these guys are coming in and pushing the sport at, at each different level you know especially when this once the bar's already here you know to go to keep pushing it it's you know you have to be in that state to yeah. do that well that's what i look at um me and maddie mcferrin have had this conversation about freestyle so there was a point well i think i don't know if surfing is going to have this but i think with motocross right or the freestyle side of things is that when the generation of kids that's killing it now, like the Harry Binks, the Josh Sheehan's, what was the bar to them was like a backflip yeah, and a backflip heel clicker. And that's like pretty attainable. Like I could do a backflip on a bike yes. in terms of physical skill. Like I, I've never done it, but I, I bet that if I had a drive to do it and I pushed and I had a foam pit and all the bullshit, I could go and do a backflip. I don't fucking ever want to. Yes. But physically, it's could, not that it's crazy. Table. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, and then you had those kids like Harry. And, and I mean, you can even do a backflip without all that bullshit, without yeah. the safety nets. People do it. But then now the kids that are watching the Harry Binks and stuff like that, like to get into freestyle now, like the level is like a stock standard deal is a double backflip. Like, you're not landing a double... Like, even a guy that has a skill, like, that's such a huge mental barrier and a physical barrier. Like, you've got to have the right ramps. You've got to... Like, that's just to get to, like, the a level... starting Yeah, point. the starting point of, yeah. like, freestyle now. So, I think that... I don't think surfing has that because the waves are kind of always going to be the waves. And I think that it's... You don't need the equipment and it's... I don't know. Like, I think it's a bit of a different deal. But you look at yeah I, I, I feel like yes and no though because there, there's yeah the waves get this big and you surf it right yeah but now like guys are in for mavericks example the young brazilian no one even looked at the left yeah right right so he comes in and he all of a sudden just starts hucking lefts and, and literally back which is right him. into the rocks right yeah it, it well, if you fall, you're in the worst spot ever because it, it'll literally drag you in the rocks, but it'll also recycle you and you won't, you're just basically stuck in this vortex right on the peak. It's, yeah, it'd be really bad to kind of fall on a big one, especially on the left. But, you know, he's hucking left, he's going right, he's trying, you know, cutbacks and like, you know, so it's kind of like you're sitting back just going, fuck, what's, you know, yeah. this is wild. And, um, that's even for wild men to say this is wild yeah but then like so where's the next generation like the younger guys they're gonna have to look at that yeah. and go if we're not doing that then we're gonna feel irrelevant yeah especially because they're in that like probably ego stage yeah they're like well, we're gonna have to do that you know if we don't then we're you know what are we trying to achieve you can't even get a start you want to be the best you know you don't want to just be like hanging on going oh yeah i'm just just you know just able to be out here yeah yeah so like yeah it's um i I feel like they're all pretty relevant you know Mm. fmx freestyle all that sort of stuff you know there's a baseline yeah an un you know unwritten baseline that you need to kind of achieve And I, I just think and yeah, that, just, that baseline is just going to get way harder to even to get achieve. a start. Yeah. And yeah. like, because a big problem that you guys are having now is like fucking Yahoo's just going out to Mavericks with no safety crew, no real experience. And it's kind of creating a bit of chaos in, and I'd bet probably because of the life, the suits, you know, sure. the vests that you guys have now, like an average kind of guy, not an average, I mean, you're still a pretty a bit of a gnarly dude to even go out there but you might not have the skills uh that are the same size as your nuts in a way oh for sure i mean big wave surfing has just gotten so popular because i'm sure that it's got something to do with the vest you know it's mm. just like a safety net that you never used to have you know like if every if everyone went out without safety vests on it'd just be a completely different game um I feel like 
yeah, obviously it's been a great thing, but it's also been a bit of a curse too. You know, the lineups in these spots are super crowded. You know, there's guys that, that are out there that probably shouldn't be out there that, you know, want to go down to the local bar and show their mates a photo of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, getting hucked on a 20-footer or something. Yeah. But, um, I mean, it's just like, it is what it is. You can't really... Yeah. You just... I guess you concentrate be, on yourself. Yeah, you're going to be getting angry at a thing you can't change. I guess. Yeah, exactly. But I guess it it does show that people are wanting to, I guess, get amongst a sport that was just man. There's a handful of people on the planet when the, when it started yeah. that would even think about doing it. Yeah, exactly. I feel like too a hard. I feel like a hard thing would be is to. You know, once you're at a level and you're pushing yourself and and you're achieving that level of, you know, uh, surfing bigger ways or competing or whatever, I feel like it's very hard to, when you get older, to want to keep doing it at not such a high level. Yeah. Like, like I know it sounds out. weird, but like just to go out and just kind of catch a few ways or something mm. like it. For me, I feel like, when i'm out there you've got to be in that kind of state where like yeah like you know fucking let's do this like it's on i feel like if you weren't in that state you're like oh yeah i don't really care you know i just i might catch a wave you know like yeah yeah i don't know i've been thinking of of that you know like um am i going to want to be still surfing big ways if i'm not hungry for it yeah yeah and and i feel like yeah that, that that for me is like something that i look at and just go i I don't have the answer i'm just kind of like i'm just yeah kind of getting deep at like wonder what that feeling is like but i look at i look at guys like dorian and he's like i feel like he was doing his best surfing like two years ago Mm. and he was you know he was 41 or something yeah um which is pretty wild you know you look at that and you kind of inspire to know that you can kind of keep pushing those boundaries um because big wave surfing is all about calculated risk getting the right waves not having too big an ego where you're gonna go a shit wave and blow your shoulder out or get yeah. a career ending injury or something like that you know so yeah well i guess it comes down to like we sort of got there before in a way and then veered off a bit yeah. but it's like the reason you do it and it's like do you know the reason you do it now is it, yeah. is it more than a job? Like, is there a soul-fulfilling thing that comes out of it? Because I think that if you... To go with kind of what you were saying is like... To keep... Wanting to keep do it, it has to serve a legitimate purpose, purpose. in your life. Yep. So it's like, if the purpose is a job and to make money and, you know what I mean, to have like a career. Like, there's a... I think that's one of the problems that people have just in general is like, when you're not working on something that's your passion then it becomes super confusing because there's a million ways to make money there's a million jobs there's a million university degrees there's a million TAFE courses there's a million random things you could do to make money so it's like I think that's why people get lost when it does come to like oh I don't like my job what am I doing blah 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 it's because like there's options when that's the thing but it's like when it's your passion it becomes easier because you don't have a lot of passions so yeah, it's like, I, you know I, what I mean? What is that? Why do you do this? I feel like too, for me, there's no way I could have got to where I've got with not loving it and, and it being a passion. Mm. I feel like the hardest thing is to understand why you do it on a deeper level too. Yeah. You know, what do you actually get from it? And so for me, I look at it and I always feel like a better person when I come in. Like if I go out for a surf, it's humbling. You know, you learn something about yourself. You challenge yourself. Um, you get humbled. Like there's so many different elements that go with surfing big waves that make make you a better person. Yeah. That I like about it. You know, you learn a lot about yourself. Um, you know, so yeah, you know, probably at some points of my career, I was doing it uh, solely because you know not solely but i was doing it because there was you know an income was a job um you know i liked it um i was good uh, i felt like i was quite good at it which is a good feeling yeah but it 
you've got to search sometimes of why you do it, especially when, you know at points in your career when you get tested, where you know either sponsorships leave you or you've got to grind it out for a bit, or you know just you, you have a bad wipeout and it really fucking rattles you. Um, so I feel like at some point of your career you've got to look at it at it on a deeper level and understand why you do it and and you do have to put your ego inside and go well okay you know where would i be without it yeah true and so there has for sure been moments where i've had to do a fair bit of soul searching and go why do i do this what do i get from it you know how's it affected me to this date and you know realistically you I am who I am because of it. You yeah. know, like I feel like, you know, without doing that, I, I wouldn't be who I am, you know? Yeah. And then I think though, do you have to get to the point where it's like, I wouldn't be who I am without this, but I'm not just this. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like not. Cause that's why I think it's hard for people to retire because or when they do retire it's a safety net lost. to keep going back to it yeah. yeah because it's like they haven't really established that relationship with themselves if that wasn't if surfing wasn't there or if motocross wasn't there like ryan dungy man like he he was on the podcast and like I'm like trying to push like dude what's next and he's like he legitimately didn't know and i felt bad i was like fuck like you've you've given yeah, your he's... life to this and then you haven't taken the time to separate it's like church yeah. and state or you know what I mean? it is really hard and and i feel like it's an important thing to get across the line because you know everyone looks at athletes and go oh man they're so lucky like this is amazing but you have to be so selfish driven mm. and know what you want from it and you can't be hustling and doing three things on the side and feel like you're going for a world title or you're going to push a sport it just doesn't happen unless you're like literally you got the blinkers on and you're focusing purely on that then you can't have like three business ventures going and you can't be supporting you know a foundation that you've super you know pumped involved on with. involved with yeah you, it's, it just doesn't happen like that you know so i feel like when something does end pretty abruptly or you have a career ending injury you know a lot of these you know it's hard people go through depression and you get lost and it's it's not a fun place to be in and um it takes a while to find yourself again i feel and um and it doesn't matter who it is that's just reality mm. because you you've been so focused and driven on one thing and when it stops you've got to find that fulfillment in other ways yeah and um and it doesn't happen overnight and you can't do that if you're at a, if you're a high level athlete. You can't just go, oh yeah, that's stopped, and now I've just drifted into this, and it just fills every single void that I want, and yeah. it's all good. Like, it's just like, well, I, it was crazy. I was watching. Um, do you ever do you ever get like you get an NFL or anything like that? Not the NFL, no, no. I, I mean, I went to a Chargers and Raiders game. That would have been pretty sick. It was it was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> where, where was it? Oakland or San Diego? No, it was in San Diego. Yeah, and, Oakland um, fans are fucking out there. Mate, it was it was funny. Like, I was pretty hungover and we were sitting on the wrong side of the stadium. Because San Diego is a good town to be keen for a drink. Like, there's a lot going on. Oh, there was heaps going on. Yeah. And we had way too much to drink the night before. We got tickets. We, we were there. We are sitting on the wrong side of the stadium. It was just baking hot. And we we're right in the middle of these Raiders fans. <laughs> and I was with a friend that was kind of like a little bit trendy, you know, like. Yeah. And, yeah. and they're not that sort of crowd. Yeah. And we're just like in the middle of these kind of He's gangster. Wearing bla- ra- He's yeah. wearing a blazer and a fucking scarf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not that trendy, but like, you know what I mean? We kind yeah. of stuck out. And, uh, and the Raiders fans were kind of, I, I feel like, yeah. And so the Raiders fans were just diehards, you know, but they were, really bad yeah i don't even think they got a score on the board oh yeah that they and that'd be really pissed. they were pissed and there was like I remember going to the food line or something like that and there was like a fight that broke out with Chargers fans and raiders fans and <laughs> i was hung over i'm like what the fuck is this all about you know and the game was really slow i didn't realize that they had a oh, lot of so stop, much off time. a lot of off time you know and so i was just like 
yeah, I, I never really got into it just because I didn't know the game that well either. Yeah, so. you, you definitely like yeah there's an understanding that has to go with it because there's not a lot of actual like snap time you know what i mean no but um it was funny like why i brought it up there's a they do dude you should watch a couple of them it's called a football life yep. and there's a ton of them on um just on youtube so i'll just watch them every now and again and um this dude chris carty is a hall of famer and um he was saying like in this thing where he retired and he's like well you just got to know that once you leave the NFL, your life will never be that good again. Yeah, exactly. Like he's, yeah, yeah, and he, he knew that. Yeah, and it was so blunt to where he was saying like, he's like, man, people don't want to hear it, but that's the top. Yeah. He's like, that's as good as it's ever going to get. He's yeah, like, and your if, life can never be better than when you've got the touchdown record of the NFL. He's like, that's the best it can be. And I was like, I was like, fuck, is that sad or is that just amazing? Reality. You know what I mean? And it's like, but it's right. People don't want to hear it. And like, I had one comment on um, one of the, like the Dungy thing where they're like, oh, spoiled athlete. Listen to this. You know, like your life was fucking sick. But it's super easy to say that from the outside. Oh, yeah. Looking in. But I mean, there is a dude, like I've, I've spent time around Dunge a lot to the point where I would have, leave shoots with him going like, fuck him like but it was not it was not out of him being an asshole it's like that's how dedicated that dude was and he won nine titles in his career that was a hall of fame career like one of the best careers ever and then it stopped like literally stopped yeah and then he's just he had no time to breathe or think about anything else it was just it's over it's gnarly and uh i've been kind of fortunate you know big wave surfing is we make peanuts and so I've always had to have something like little going on. And I guess your schedule's not like requiring. No, it's not yeah. like five events all structured. You know, the tour only came about like four years ago. Yeah. And so, you know, obviously to prepare for these days, you always had to be ready, you know, to surf big waves and when the swells came and stuff. So that was hard because you always had to be ready no matter what. Um, but yeah, it wasn't very structured, you know, so... I was kind of lucky that I've been out to, to focus on some other stuff. Yeah. But yeah, like it's very easy to say athletes got a, the best life ever, but you know, there's a lot of dedication. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. And, and when those, when it does switch off and, and you know, you, you don't get a th- hundred messages in your inbox and like, you yeah. know, like all these things, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, you know? And um, yeah, yeah. I feel like, if you kind of have the right expectations and and know that you know i'm yeah i i feel like there's a lot to learn from it and good and bad yeah but yeah it's definitely a hard transition i think for a lot of people for sure yeah when you were saying that you want to do some like talks and stuff like that are you working on that kind of stuff yeah i've been i've actually been doing a bit of keynote stuff lately yeah it's fun. It, it actually gives me the same buzz as, as you know, getting ready to, to go, f- you know, surf big waves because it's so foreign to me, you know. Um, yeah. I've never been... Getting it's that uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for sure. Yeah. And just knowing that you can screw it up, you know, knowing that you're speaking to people that are really intelligent and they're going to pick up on any, any sort of little screw up that you do. I'm super fresh to it. Um, you know, I've, I've only really kind of just started and i've i'm doing that because i do have a good story to tell and you know there are certain things that i've learned in my sport that can correlate yeah you know to professional jobs and people that are you know doctors or whatever you know if if you structure it right um around fear and you know commitment preparation all those sort of things and and so i'm just kind of you know looking into that and um yeah like i said it's it's pretty scary but you know once you do one you finish it you're like yeah it kind of it does it gives you a a bit of a buzz and um it's yeah it pays pretty well too what made you get into that uh because i guess there's always got to be like a spark you know what i mean for an idea to be like you know i I could do that well mark matthews does it Ah, he's a good friend of mine and you know he's uh, living here now eh? yeah he is yeah yeah and so, you know, I was, I saw, you know, the injury that, that occurred to him when, you know, he pretty he, much nearly lost his leg. Yeah. And 
he's been doing the corporate stuff for a while and were you with him that day that he did that i was i was about to go on the trip like i just cancelled um yeah, right. like two days before it and it was a red bull shoot and i wasn't really involved in the shoot so I, I just i canned it um and yeah like heard about what happened like that day and i was just kind of couldn't really get my head around it like yeah he's like yeah he's uh I spoke to his his partner and she's like yeah you could potentially lose his leg and did he get compartment syndrome or something is that what it was uh, or what, what what why did he almost lose his leg the whole capsule spun 180 degrees and ruptured a an artery got internal bleeding and um tore everything off the bone and yeah literally had to get maddie back to the the hospital for from what i believe and yeah literally had an open wound because they couldn't obviously stitch it up from, yeah. from the pressure and yeah it was gnarly like and and to see obviously someone that i, I surf with regularly you know in big ways and, and you ways. know his skill level and you know yeah. his preparation well and just to see the sort of wave that it happened on was like it was pretty minor compared to what we have surfed together and you know to see that you know i'm like geez man i've got to kind of like focus on something else a little bit more mm. um to to make sure that there is some sort of safety net there and then obviously to see you know what he gets from the the corporate speaking and you know we've both got obviously our own stories to tell yeah. and and so I'm, I'm kind of focusing a bit on that as, as well and um yeah I, I don't know it's it's like i said it's still pretty fresh but yeah i'll see where it goes and if i keep enjoying it i'll keep doing it but if it's not a passion then i'll be over it and what sort of stuff are you kind of talking about is it mainly that it's mainly, i guess overcoming fear and it's preparation fear and also overcoming adversity yeah you know, certain things that happen um in my career and and still are happening and and you know how i kind of changed it and and got over mental barriers and hurdles and stuff like that um you know obviously that happens in in everyday life and especially you know people that are in high positions in the corporate world they have to go through that probably on the same sort of level but obviously in a different realm in a different realm you know we're kind of doing it within elements of nature and and um you know stuff that can potentially kill you and they're doing it where they've got huge consequences of you know people's money and and whatnot so especially with doctors like you can kill people too yeah, like exactly. you know the risk is kind of on another person which has got to be pretty heavy yeah yeah exactly you know they've got you know yeah it's it's it is a lot more relevant than what you think yeah for yeah. sure i think just i think just fear in in general is like there's so many types of fear too that i think that when you talk about fear you go straight to that like should i take off on this wave yes or no kind of um or should i you know do this jump on a bike that is fear but i think that there's so many different levels of fear that i think people need to i guess like acknowledge and be like oh okay i'm super yeah. scared of that you're but scared for a reason like your body yeah. is getting you scared for a reason it's not That's like, like a survival fight or flight yeah. kind of fear but, but there's processes around making sure that you make the right decision because of that that fear element coming in to basically give you the warning that that could potentially yeah. harm you you know like and i feel like those processes of dealing with that fear element is super important mm. not just go oh i'm i'm scared ah oh, screw it it's just like a little thing that your body's telling you let's go jump yeah. it <laughs> yeah yeah you know what i mean like but then i think there's a fear of like fear of failing fear of looking stupid in front of your mates fear of what people's perception of you is going to be and i think that that's a harder one to navigate in yeah, a way true. you know yeah. what i mean and i think that yeah I, I think that you kind of throw a blanket over the term fear or not you but we all as all society them, yeah. throw this blanket thing of like a bear's running at you like i'm fucking booking it <laughs> out of here like that is yeah. fear but that's one dimension of fear and i think that the other stuff's harder to get over like the what are people going to think of me what are you know what's my parents going to say like because i think you know a lot of people it's such an uncomfortable feeling that it is easier just to go nah, i just won't deal with that you know what i mean yeah so it's exactly like, do you 
do you, I guess, like teach processes then to, with like how you've got around the physical fear? And do you think that that's something that people can like kind of apply to the other fears in their life? The only thing I can do is to relate my experiences of fear yeah. to them. Yeah. I'm not a fear expert. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not smart enough to navigate their fears to what I do. I just tell my story and how I've basically dealt with the processes of fear within my line of work. And if they can take something from that yeah. and be smart enough to go, oh shit, that's kind of similar to what I deal with. Like maybe yeah. I could try to try that process. I'm not trying to go, look, this is what you have to do to deal with fear. Yeah. Like I'm an expert at fear, like do this. Like there's no way I'd get lost. Yeah. I'd get up there and just be like, cause it's all shit. so down to the individual. It's very individual. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like the only thing I can do is tell my story. And if they can relate to it and learn something from it, then that's great. Well, I think like... And I, it's interesting for them. They're, it's so left field. Yeah, for sure. You know, they're not used to hearing people like myself talk, you know, so... Well, I don't think people are used to hearing people like you talk about being scared. Because True. that's the thing I think that people will... Um, I mean, even for me, like before I started filming with athletes and because I get to see that I've documented the process of people overcoming fear for the last 10 years. Yes. And it's like the common thing is they're all scared. And I think that before I started, I guess, the process of like legitimately documenting guys like yourself overcome fear, I thought, oh, he's just got massive nuts and isn't scared of anything where it's quite the opposite. It's that you guys are just the guys that are scared and have figured out a way around it to get the job done. It still scares you, but you've had the goal and you've said, okay, this is how I navigate this fear to get the result I want. Especially within that field. Like you might have guys that are fearless on a motorbike or fearless in big ways, but if you try to, you know, throw them in front of people, they can't talk. Yeah. You know, like for me, I'm dealing with a whole different feeling of fear you know, to what I'm used to, you know, with surfing bigger waves. And I feel like kind of that is secretly driving me more towards doing a bit more of it because yeah. it's kind of like, where can I get that bit of a buzz that I get from surfing big waves? Well, and you know, the you know the reward that comes with from doing it. Doing it. Yeah. yeah. And I think Harry Bink was a cool one on the podcast because he talked a lot about just saying yes, 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 yes to like these things that scare him. And then you develop this relationship with fear and yourself to where it's like almost a positive. It's like, yes. you know that this good thing comes out of being scared. So like, just, yeah, let's just do it. Yes. And it's almost like fear is the first thing and then you get through it and then you get the reward. Whereas people avoid the fear Altogether. and avoid the reward and then they'll chase a reward somewhere Without else. Without the fear, yeah. yeah. It doesn't, it, yeah. The two kind of, I think there's a happy medium too, you know, like to also... <laughs> to understand that that fear is there for a reason yeah and if you can just keep saying yes 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 yeah without understanding you know what, the consequences the, the consequences of that fear and the processes of dealing with that fear then yeah you can find yourself in a bit of trouble you know you can make one decision that could that could really fuck you up and and your career just because you've said yep i'm doing it yeah I'm, i've got it but if you don't yeah, if you, don't, if you don't pay attention, yeah. it can kind of, yeah, well, bite I think you on the ass a bit. There's, I, I think though, you know, you get those people where um, the, the fear is not like that physical thing. And I think where, I think everyone kind of, like the ice bath, for example. Yes. Like, I don't think people would say, I'm scared to get in there. But that thing that pushes back for getting in there in the first place, that's fear. Oh, for sure. And you might be able to call it something else or like, I don't want to be cold, but I don't want is like, I'm scared of being cold. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, people need to readjust their language of fear. And yeah. if you, I think that if you really analyze it just the everyday, like we're not talking big waves or motocross or anything like that. Now it's like, if you really analyze the things that you're scared of, like you're scared of a lot in life as oh, yeah. the average guy. And it's like, Oh, I don't want to go for a run today because my legs are sore. Well, you're scared of having sore legs. You're yeah. scared of going for a run. You're, you're, that's fear. So I think that, yeah, it's just interesting to 
really like if you could admit to yourself all the shit you're scared of in your life <laughs> yeah. then it becomes you'd be like the yes man you know, yeah that, that, and i think that, that's <laughs> I, yeah well i think that's more where you know that process of harry is like yeah. yes to to those things that they're, they're inconsequential in terms of a physical consequence yes but it's still something you're scared of and i think that we're we're super smart in the way that we intellectualize to where we make don't you, want to call it fear. Well, yeah, you make yourself feel better for yep. not sugarcoating the fear element. Yeah, exactly. So oh, I've got the I've got a bit of a flu coming on. I mightn't jump in the ice bath or like dude. I know, yeah, I do that anything, shit. Anything, yeah. Well, that's like Ricky said to me the other day. She's like, "Oh, you might be getting sick," and I'm like, "No, I'm not." <laughs> and I, you know, like you just you can't. Well, I think once you can, it's powerful once you start playing games with yourself. Oh, for sure. And turning that shit because, man, it's so easy to succumb and just, you know, be the little sausage dog that rolls on his belly and it's just like, nah, it's yeah. all good, like the full submission roll. Yeah. But it's like, if you could, yeah, turn it into a game and like really fuck with yourself and see if you can, again, for the inconsequential stuff that yes. you're scared of. Because i'm not saying go surf big waves because you're a pussy i'm saying yeah you know what i mean like start, stop rationalizing the, everything the little shit because that is fear hidden in your Agenda. intellect in a way yeah yeah because it's like we're smart man we're smart enough to say exactly oh no i got the flu i better not yeah That's you're like, smart enough to sugarcoat yeah the fear yeah exactly <laughs> what um what are you into outside of surfing like what do you get in like deep into Mate, I, in all honesty, right now, I don't have a whole lot of time for anything else. Um, you know, with the other things I'm setting up, I've got, I just had a newborn about five weeks ago. I've got two, two girls now. And uh, my, my eldest, which is nearly three, she's a firecracker. So, yeah, right. Yeah, she, she's full on, man. I've got to, you know, obviously right now I'm focusing a lot on, on the family life, but I love spearing, um, spear fishing when I get a chance. You know, obviously, right into training and the whole breath thing. Um, you know, obviously, so I still surf every day. Yeah, every day, even if it's small, I love getting out there. Foiling, I've been getting into the foil boarding. Yeah, right. <laughs> loyal, Did you see Joel, loyal to the foil? Did you see uh, Joel Tudor's Instagram? Oh, uh, he's like, if you're not John and someone get the fuck off these death machines yeah, or something yeah. like that, dude. I've been hit with longboard fins. I don't want a fucking foil coming uh, that, out. Those things are going to be deadly. Like if I see people out, I'm over it. I won't. Like there's some people that you'll see out the alley and stuff, and you know they're cutting in between people. And even oh. I think even if I was really good at it which i'm not like yeah. i can do it but i'm not really good i still wouldn't go near people just because those things will literally cut you up yeah it'll be bad if you see 20 guys out the alley don't go out if they're out <laughs> in foils you're over it what's your home break like where where's your go-to spot well i, I live down just south of the border i yeah. bought some property down there and the goldie got a bit too much so uh, I'm close, but I'm not too close. Yeah, yeah, arm's length. <laughs> yeah. So where do you go out? Like, uh, I, oh, I guess you've got a little bit of coastline. Yeah, there's so much coastline out. down there that I kind of just check. So like, you know, like along the Tweed Coast and yeah. wherever's good, kind of get away. But always, I mean, if the banks are good at, if, the, if there's a swell running, I'll surf Kira or, yeah. you know, the points here. Uh, you got a crazy yeah. one that last swell. Um, or was it the swell before? Maybe the swell, swell before. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. the comp was the comp kind of killed the last swell, right? Yeah, I was but, working at the comp, yeah, so oh, that's I was right. doing the ski stuff there. Yeah, so I was kind of watching a lot of good waves, which was. Does that piss you off a bit? Ah, uh, it was all right. I've you've you know, got some before, I guess. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there was one I, I saw on video of the Kira. I guess yeah, it must have been the the swell before. I think it was just fucking yeah. running, and you're just pulling in, pulling it, and yeah, I think from memory you had to like really race to get that first kind of barrel section anyway yeah yeah I, we're pretty lucky i mean you don't realize how good the waves are and you're like why does it get so crowded here you yeah know? but like if you live somewhere else in oz and you're like you're seeing three locations that have perfect long points yeah you kind of realize like it's pretty unique you know yeah. it's not like and you're, you're in board shorts you're in board shorts and then you walk across the road and you can get a good coffee yeah there's a good chance you're not going to get mopped by a great white yeah somewhere like somewhere else in remote oz yeah you know so yeah it makes sense why everyone wants to live here but it is getting pretty hectic yeah it's like 
yeah especially when yeah the older you get you're kind of like fuck i'm kind of over this crowd yeah like i won't surf there unless it's really, really good thing yeah. yeah and then i guess the herd kind of thins out a little bit anyway well, yeah a little bit yeah it's still pretty hectic what um <laughs> What made you get into the UFC stuff so much? Because you're pretty into it, eh? Yeah, yeah, I know. I like, I like it. Um, Did you watch yesterday? I missed it. Yeah, I, I didn't get to see it. Oh, yeah. It was pretty good. How did he... I heard it was a lot closer than... Um, oh, like, my take on it is... Um, so, that Al Iquinta dude's, like, a really good wrestler. Oh, for sure. And I Wrestles think, bears and shit. No, that's Habib. Oh, I, yeah, Habib. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but exactly. he, the guy he was facing was also, like, a really good wrestler. Oh, he's a black belt, isn't he? um no i just think he's a old school like he was a college like a really good college wrestler we're talking about the uh the um habib fight yeah Habib yeah. versus ally quinta yeah. yeah yeah so he's not he's not like a jiu-jitsu dude or anything but he's a um well he fought the hawaiian though right uh no 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 oh so you didn't know that so um they wouldn't let max fight why because he he had like 10 pounds to cut in a day and they were saying like... So they didn't fight in the end? No. So he fought this dude, Al Iaquinta. Okay, I'm like, have you got it wrong? Like, nah, I'm like, did nah, you nah. watch the fight? Nah, nah. <laughs> right. Yeah, so last minute. Yeah, so they, they just said it was... It literally two. must have been last minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was day, like the day of the weigh-ins. So he, like, he couldn't even get down to that nah. heavier weight. No, nah, so uh, yeah, because he walks around at like 180, 175 pounds. So he had like 30 pounds to cut so within that well because i remember i remember in the press conference i was like you know how are you going to cut this weight within six days and he's just like he yeah, just brushed it off yeah, like yeah. it was nothing i'm like how like he must weigh he must walk around like yeah he's super heavy. heavy yeah well he's a tall yeah, yeah. A tall dude so that happened and then ally quinta who was also on the card but then it all just got shuffled around because they dropped three fights because of the whole connor thing and Jeez, um, he went off his head didn't he fuck, that was weird <laughs> um so then, yeah, that they got in this Al Iquinta dude who's um, from Long Island. So he had like the whole New York crowd there. But he's a wrestler. So Habib's a wrestler. Oh, wow. And then the first two rounds, he just beat the piss out of him. Like just did what he always does, took him to the ground, beat the piss out of him. Oh, so he did take a wrestler to the ground a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And he, he smoked him. And there was like in round one, he could have choked him. Round two could have choked him could have come him like he could have stopped the fight and he was just dragging it out yeah oh yeah but he said that like i was texting some buddies and they're like oh this is going to be over quick and i was like now i'm pretty sure he'll stay in for five rounds just to beat the piss out of this dude because he was saying that to max too yeah yeah it's like i'm ready for five rounds like yeah. he's, he's <laughs> that's the thing with the beep like he's always had these injuries to where he's so in and out of the ufc through injury and you just and then like the fights with tony ferguson get cancelled so he's like He's just never getting that ring Shot, time. And yeah. then people are dodging him. So, like, basically, first two rounds, beat the piss out of him. Could have finished it, like, easily, well, man. Obvi like, it was obvious. That obviously. He like, if you had know anything about any ground yeah. work, like... He, he had his back next, and... Next yeah. there, he's laid flat. And, like, he, so he's laid flat, both hooks in, and just punching the dude in the head. And he's, like, they're talking... He's, like, talking to him, doing his normal what? Khabib shit. Jesus. And then the third round, he shot for a couple, like, kind of weak singles and then he just started boxing the dude and like so al's trying to but like khabib didn't even have a scratch on him so he's just playing that sort of defense and like it's funny whenever rogan says anything on the broadcast if you go onto like the comments of any ufc picture after the fight yeah they fucking copy like exactly the like everybody copies the exact point that he said and so joe was making a thing where he was like going back with his chin up he's like man if, you know that chin he's exposing his chin blah, blah blah but like like i was saying to my mates texting after the fight i was like if you don't feel like you're in danger then like what are you going to defend you know what i mean like if yeah, you yeah. literally feel like this guy cannot do anything to you then yeah you kind of can what round reckless. what round was that though like third yeah so you probably yeah he so probably he went, wasn't doing that the first two rounds no exactly it so, only takes one little tag on your chin and you you're done you know especially with those gloves it's like yeah that can someone put, yeah. can get pretty lucky well <laughs> but really, by the third i mean he's probably figured him out that he's yeah he just, wasn't there and the shots weren't even landing yeah. and like he was moving back but then like you'd see oh al just threw a couple bombs but it was just all like overhand rights and yeah, he's, he's just, just doing the shoulder roll. Yeah. And um, so then, yeah, three and four, he just stood up and like that. But 
that that ally quinta dude like jabbed him like five times in the face and he just nodded at him the whole time oh wow so yeah he had nothing what's that no oh habib was just like jabbing him yeah yeah and um but like it was just it was just like a weird dynamic and it was like then he sort of half shot for a couple but then just stayed standing and then the last round took him to the ground beat the piss out of him again tried for a couple half chokes but it was almost like he'd use a choke to set up more chokes no like, like punches more. to the face oh right so it was like getting you know getting an arm in and then posting on the arm and then just like wailing Feeding on him again yeah. yeah so it was just like that fight where every like everyone on instagram and twitter after that fight was like oh tony and connor knocks him the fuck out in the first round i'm like kind of man like did you not see what he did in the first two rounds to so like a way better wrestler yeah than connor or tony it's like weird though. pretty much it's have zero confidence in connor on the ground it's zero it's weird though that he didn't just end it because now people are like but that's exactly what you I know said. what i mean like it, that's the negative it's weird because he'd be like well he couldn't even finish old oh, mate you know it went five rounds you know but obviously he probably meant to to drag it out but he probably should have just finished it that way that, you know yeah because there was this real fear that come with Khabib that everyone had like every there was like there was this uh like a aura about him and the way that people spoke about him and then but he'd never given anyone a chance to like doubt that and then he he did he just let the door open but obviously he just doesn't give a fuck oh it would have been sick to see max i oh, know do you know have you met him through, i met like, him once yeah, yeah right yeah because he seems he, like a really nice he, i mean he's he was a nice guy like, yeah for sure the whole, that, that Hawaiian, the West Side Hawaiian thing. Yeah. Yeah. He wouldn't back down from anything. No, fuck no. Like, <laughs> you can see that, you know? Yeah. And that's why, like, back to the conversation earlier that I had, you know, it's it's a wild place. You know, you, on the North Shore, they've got some of the best fighters in the world that yeah. just go post up there. And it's like, the best waves are here, but they're there to train for, to be some of the best fighters in the world right around all these surfing locations and they're in people's like garages and stuff yeah like you roll up to to do a, a bit of jewelry or something and like bj Penn's there and like all these guys from the ufc and you're kind of like geez heavy. it's kind of like a heavy vibe yeah yeah is that what got you into because you said you're the longest serving white belt ever is in that, history is that <laughs> <laughs> is that um is that what got you into it like spending time on the north shore uh yeah yeah I, I mean i'd love like now that i've probably got a bit more time to to do a bit more you know dewy and stuff but yeah obviously all my mates do it and yeah you know it's it's, it's massive in it's surfing huge. now eh? yeah well, it's, i guess it's just massive everywhere but it's massive everywhere but you know obviously you know i've had mates that have been doing it for for you know forever yeah yeah how um how does that kind of fear relate to um the surfing stuff like were you pretty nervous when you first started like legitimately rolling or no like it was good like yeah you, no yeah, i wasn't nervous good. one yeah. bit i was just like yeah if someone catches me out of like oh yeah, yeah. just tap like yeah that'd be sick if i that, could do that surfing. yeah you'd be like no no, no, I'm, <laughs> no, no, down, no I'm down yeah, yeah i'm down tap out i'm done yeah. that's a that's like a massive ego thing too though like because you'll see people that will just they can't they can't get oh, especially that, in that you know. in that white belt realm yeah like, yeah guys are trying to kill you hang on for dear life yeah. dude. i just want to get out of a white belt so i don't have to roll with any more white belts yeah how how um how long have you been doing it oh just on and off for like probably four years yeah right but i'm so inconsistent yeah yeah you probably if you went and gave it a crack for you know six or eight months like you could probably i could for you sure. could probably get your blue belt pretty easy with that definitely much time. yeah i could have you had like one academy that you've kind of stuck to or it's just been whenever um, you've traveled i like i like flow down at Coolangatta, yeah. just because a lot of the brazilian guys surf yeah so i see them out in the water and I, it was actually funny the first time i went in there um obviously there's a lot of brazilians that surf around Coolangatta. yeah and, you know you have to be pretty ruthless in the water and there was a couple that you know maybe i'd dropped in on or something like that yeah and the first day i walked in there they they were all like staring at me this motherfucker yeah <laughs> and i think i'm like what have i got myself into here like yeah. and i kind of got a bit rattled i'm like Fuck, you know have i had beef with any of these guys or yeah. have i had a run in with them in the water but no they're was, they was super nice and um it's just easy you know i've got friends yeah that that 
you know, obviously go there and it's a good vibe. So I just roll there. Oh, when, when I had Hoy on the podcast, he was talking about like, oh, we said something because last time I surfed, um, it was, I think on that swell, we were talking about where you got that good run at Kira. Yeah. Um, oh, I was surfing like greeny and that. And this just like full Aussie tradie dude was just like blowing out like go back to Sao Paulo and I'm just like and I'm like bro bro don't say that shit like you don't know like what that motherfucker puts around his waist like yeah. you have oh. no idea yeah and it's like it's, you it's, say to you say to people like I'll talk to people like look you can watch people do jujitsu and it looks like a fair fight yeah but they both know jujitsu yeah exactly it's like you take a person that doesn't know jiu-jitsu and then you put them against a person that does know jiu-jitsu and it's like you're not watching the same thing anymore no like, no. you're watching a, a boa constrictor around a fucking child yes like, that's the level yeah. and i don't think people and the ufc gives people a false sense of what jiu-jitsu is i think in a way because those dudes know jiu-jitsu oh yeah it's just like like everyone does like when yeah. like so when like um brian ortega choked out frankie edgar yes frankie edgar's a black belt yeah yeah and, and he, he made him kind of look oh he didn't choke him out sorry um cub swanson is what i meant to say oh right yes but yeah you, you, yeah i makes know what him, you're saying yeah, it makes yeah. him look like so you're like oh fuck like but that guy knows that he's a black belt so yeah, imagine exactly. you get a dude that's a black belt in the water out there with you what, and you don't know and you're talking shit and you go into the beach like there's no chance no nah, it's got, over yeah you got to be very at, le- at least at least jewelry. if you know the fundamentals of Dewey mm. and something obviously did happen you know if someone's a badass at Dewey to get up and like at yeah. least posture up and, and, and try to get your feet <laughs> off <laughs> but i feel Just, like yeah i feel like if you got in a situation where you got in like a fight with a dude that knows jiu-jitsu and you kind of know jiu-jitsu i feel like it'd just turn into a match and if he caught you he'd just let you go <laughs> don't you reckon i, don't, I mean i yeah, guess it depends. I, who knows i, I mean, guess it depends but i feel I, I think especially with like a brazilian dude because they they feel almost like, like respect you like, oh yeah I, both, that's what, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think like if he's like oh hip escape okay yeah, yeah. fair enough fair enough <laughs> and they'd be like maybe you just go like no 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 no, i'm done and he'd probably let you go. or if he was real pissed and he was the black belt you'd just be waking Asleep. up yeah oh shit okay. yeah because you just wake yeah. up and you're like what the fuck but that would be an easy way out i think I'd, for I'd, sure i'd like to get choked out and like if you went if someone called you out in the beach and then they just were crazy at stand up or muay thai they just kicked your leg out and just started punishing you i'd way prefer to get choked out by a black belt yeah this just shows <laughs> a little bit of mercy yeah but yeah i always see like yeah you're right there's so many down in like Cooley and that whole that whole stretch of that's why it was mate. funny when i walked in there i'm like oh, oh shit what have i done <laughs> oh, oh that's super cool yeah it's yeah. um yeah you just don't don't want to fuck with brazilian surfing you just don't want to deal with you just don't want to fight in general not in general yeah that's true yeah. um so have you trained on like the north shore so you've like trained in bj penn's gym and stuff like that no 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 I, i've just uh, i've yeah you know, usually when i'm in hawaii i'm there to surf you know yeah i don't really care too much about you know going to dewey like my, my focus is just to surf and yeah generally when i go the waves are always good you know and because i'm not used to rolling all the time you know like i pull up sore yeah for a couple of days and i'm like oh was it really worth it i just missed out on really good ways because i rolled for too long or something like that so you know i i'd, I'd rolled at um sunset jiu-jitsu a few times and yeah it's i kind of i'm more i'd be more inclined to want to you know roll when i'm at home because yeah when you got a bit of downtime yeah and the waves i'm not really worried if i miss a yeah day at snapper that two foot yeah exactly and <laughs> yeah, not stressing too hard yeah exactly how long um how long till the podcast is going on your end um i've ordered the equipment so Ooh. yeah it was a big step yeah it was a massive step actually it's not that cheap either is it's it? not cheap no and i was like that fear thing again yeah like, true way eh? i wonder if it's shit what am i gonna do i'm gonna have all this equipment and so it was a pretty big step and um yeah i'm just gonna you know if it goes shit maybe i might just have to offload some equipment <laughs> <laughs> no nah, you'll be right yeah what have you got like a name for it and shit uh i've got um yeah i've got a few up in the air but nothing in concrete yet i, I just want to i want to try to get like five under my belt yeah and just purely just roll 
and then you know obviously get some good conversations going with some friends um you know like i'd love to do one with mick now that he's actually retired yeah. um you know maybe you know do one with kelly just because you know i've got access to those guys and yeah you know so just just try to get some of those out of the way and and see where it goes and you know hopefully i'm enjoying it and stuff and you know it's it's easy i mean yeah realistically you're just having a chat to a mate yeah and um and it's fun you know so that's um definitely not trying to break any records or like be the next joe rogan but yeah just just something to do you'll get like you'll definitely get um i guess what we were saying like you got to find the reason why and i definitely had that thing where i was like because it it is a weird situation and you're used to being on camera and like performing and in in a different realm but i for me was like man i've been deleting my voice out of interviews for 10 years have you have you um have you done a podcast that you thought was going to go well and it was just really hard like a person you don't have to obviously mention names but like like my fear is like to to do a podcast with someone that i think is going to be really good yeah i have no connection and the podcast just turns to shit. It just doesn't. You well, know? I think that it's just like, and what we were kind of saying before is like, I've kind of thought like, oh, should I try and know a lot about a person? Because like, I think there's been times where like you've got a guest on and the your audience kind of expects you to ask certain things. Yes. Like, like, so with me, I'll probably leave here and then a full Ryan Hipwood fan is going to go like, oh, you should have asked him about that time he wiped out here or yes. he got this crazy. And I'm like, well, fuck, I didn't really know about that. And it's like, I think that you can get into a a spot where... I it's get, just questions. You're yeah, just like, like I can go either way where yeah. it's like, am I trying to... Do I want to know about stuff that's like easily Googleable? Yeah. And yeah, it's or, or do we want to... Like you was, you know, there's been points in this where you're like, I don't even know how I feel about that. And it's like, it's yeah, like exactly. oh, well then let's just talk about it. You've yeah. got time. So it's like, I feel like when it's an interview and you've got those set questions, then um, it doesn't give you as much room to kind of deviate, right? Well, for me, when you listen to a podcast, you want to hear stuff that you haven't heard, heard before. before. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't want to hear the same set questions, you yeah. know? And I feel like, if you if i'm doing a podcast with someone i want to i want them to be into it so it's not the same stuff they've been asked Asked a thousand times yeah yeah that's definitely the the thing that i guess you run with athletes but i guess like yeah i kind of run on the thinking of and especially at the start it was people i knew really well so i kind of knew the questions that'd be asked and and i think that if it's with athletes i've got a pretty good idea of what people get asked because i've been the dude doing the asking asking um but yeah so i guess like that's the only thing like i've never really had one that didn't go well or i was like oh that was awkward i couldn't get a connection but i think that um you've just got to realize people are different and, and, it's and like, adapt a bit too. Yeah. yeah. So like, well, perfect example, Courtney Atkinson. I've, that dude's a legend. Like he's an Olympian, yes. like Red Bull triathlete. Like the dude's a G. He's been to these crazy places, but there's a in, there's an intensity with him. Like he's an intense guy. He thinks intense. He talks intense. Like, yes. And then you've got to kind of like... Ramp your shit up. <laughs> yeah. And I, I didn't... I was like, fuck, Courtney's bringing the heat, you know? <laughs> but then with me and you... <laughs> you're like so, super laid back yeah so it's like you can almost you almost slow down so i think it's just i guess expectation breeds some kind of let down it's like if you don't have an expectation you want me to you speed shit up for you mate oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i mean so it's like but i yeah. didn't have an expectation yeah with, so it's like you just get in you just fucking do it but i think i don't know there's pros and cons to to doing it that way of like not doing any research because there's probably some yeah like some guy that knows your career that's like fuck you didn't even ask me about the best thing ever yeah i'm like well i don't know and then like i don't know maybe it's like well you didn't bring that up maybe that's not your best thing ever so i think that i've just solely run on the the uh, my agenda is have a conversation that i would just want to have without too much going too hard into it because I think that, like, you see it, I always relate it to, like, bands, right? Yeah. So, you get, like, um, it's like a ground, like, tool, 
groundbreaking. Yeah. They don't give a fuck. They're not trying to make a sound for anybody. They're just doing their own thing or like Rage Against the Machine. Yes. And then you get people that are like, oh, that was really popular. I want to make the Rage Against the Machine sound. And then you start playing to an audience. And then the problem is like when Matty Mac, um, the problem is when there's like the, there's a really wide range of subjectivity there. People move on, trends change, people's change. So I think that, yeah, any anytime you start reading too far into like, what the masses might think, then you sort of play and catch up. Yeah, like you can exactly. never really be on trend, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're always chasing your tail yeah. a little bit. So I think that's been my thing with this is like, sometimes maybe I don't ask the right questions that I should have, but I'm just asking the questions and like take it or leave it almost <laughs> yeah. because it's, it. and it, I don't know, like I don't want it to sound douchey, but it's like, you you just can't please well, it's, it's your it's your podcast that's so true it's mine <laughs> you're gonna be happy with it yeah and like you can't like i'd get lost man like i'd get lost in trying to please people and trying to like you just i guess you just have to back yourself to be like all right this many people have listened to it this far that obviously there's people that like it and if people drop off along the way bummer like i'd love to have more the most people listening the yeah better. exactly but you've just i think for consistency sake and long term sake you just have to be doing the, the way that it comes natural to you to do it yeah and that's yeah I, I i feel like if there's set questions it almost takes you down the wrong path a bit too you know what it's like you know when you travel without really booking much shit yes I and know you end up I, having a fucking yeah. sick trip yeah and like then if you have the fully planned trip then i don't someone, plan anything i'm the same i'm the worst i mean if my wife wants me to plan something, it just rattles me. I just can't do it. I'm the exact, like, it stresses me out to book something in advance. Can't do it. More than it does to rock up at an, at an airport day of with a ticket. If my wife says we're going camping in two weeks. You I, don't want to go. I just can't do it. Yeah. I'm the it it rat- absolutely rattles me. <laughs> I say, and people think it's yeah. ludicrous. Like, they're like, what do you mean? Well, we don't do anything. She's like, we can't plan anything. I'm like, well, I just don't plan. It's not what I do. I'm so, I'm exactly the same. Like, I say to people, like, well, especially Ricky. I shouldn't say people. I say to Ricky, um, planning something gives me the same stress of you not planning something. Yeah, for sure. Just because, like, a person, like, so with Rick, she'd be like, all right, we've got to make a plan. We've got to do it that same anxiety that she's feeling to like get it done is the same anxiety I'll get if it gets done. So I'm like, just, I don't know, my hands are tired. What you do you just, want me to yeah. do? I, I just, yeah, plan it, but I can't guarantee it's going to happen. I'm the exact same. Like we got a wedding in o- October. I want to go. Yeah. But if someone like, if Chris Hemsworth goes, hey, Jace, mate, we're going to do a podcast this day, this time, can't be, I'm like, fuck, I'm, oh, I'm probably going. <laughs> That's a bad example. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Like sometimes stuff comes up where you cannot say no to it. Like it could be, you know, life-changing this, life-changing that, this. And it's so open-ended. I, I think, especially in our lifestyle where it's just, you're just one opportunity to the next. Well, you just so, I'm so used to not planning, you know, yeah. like especially... You know, with swells and stuff, they just pop up. Yeah. You get a mate, oh, have you seen it? And you're like literally on edge just tracking this thing. And then you don't, I literally, I haven't made a full decision until about... The 11th hour. No, not even that. Like five hours. I'll wait till the death. And then like, I'm literally trying to pack everything within an hour to get to Brisbane to fly out. Yeah. And like, sometimes I don't even like fully know if i'm going to commit once i've already bought the ticket yeah like i might i might pull out yeah. like i feel like the hardest thing for me with with swells or planning is like committing to actually go yeah once i'm there it's just like oh it's 20 feet tomorrow who cares i'm already here yeah well that's but actually a- to get to that point is is sketchy yeah yeah i i think the same thing and i i just think like especially in this space of it's more so the film stuff than the podcast stuff but in the film stuff man i'm just living one fucking shoot to the next yeah and it's like you kind of don't ever have security in when you're i guess when you work for yourself in any realm like there's no security there 
And I think that if you own like a window tinning business on the Gold Coast, then yeah, like you know where you're going to go every day. But in like this realm of being a freelance filmmaker, like man, my mum, I'll just like text my mum one day. She asked me, she's like, oh, can you, can you log on and do this? Uh, it was like some banking or tax shit. And I was like, oh, I'm in Alaska. And I was like in the fucking North Pole <laughs> in a helicopter. <laughs> she and, couldn't get her head around it. Yeah. And she's yeah. just like, she's like, oh, you didn't tell me you were going to Alaska. And I was like, well, that's because I just literally got asked the day that we flew out. People can't understand that. I'll go to Tahiti for three days to surf yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, big time. And there's like a pretty high chance sometimes that when you get there, it's Don't shit. You. Like for instance, I went to Nazare for the first time at the start of the year. Yeah. And obviously it's a long trip over there from here. I was tracking the swell. They were about to call the event on, which I was in. I wanted to get out some experience before the event. I had never surfed the, over there. Never really even been to Europe before. And so... Really? Was, until this year? Well, I, I went to Ireland, but I hadn't been to like Portugal and France and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, so... I was speaking to a friend. I'm like, what do you think? You know, he obviously knew that the maps over there better than what I did. He's like, jump on a flight. It's on. I got to Dubai and he goes, I got a text straight. You know, when you turn your phone yeah. on or you're off yeah. airplane mode, like five text messages. Yeah. Have you left yet? Um, maps have gone terrible. It's going to be fucking onshore and shit. Don't come. And I'm like, Looking at him at Dubai, flight's about to leave in another hour. I'm like, I was literally about to like Circle get on a back. flight to go back to Sydney and there was no connecting to go back. So I just had to jump on the flight, end up going there. It was shit. But then the next swell was like 40 feet and it was the biggest swell they've had all year. And Really? I, I Literally because I've been focusing on paddling, I didn't have any tow board. So that place, like guys are going there to get the biggest wave ever. And they're and, doing that on tow boards. Eh? On tow boards. Yeah. And like I've obviously purely been focusing on paddling in and haven't really cared about trying to catch the biggest wave ever. So I was kind of like the forecast that was looking shit was actually quite good for the tow guys. Yeah, okay. So I got there that night, never been there, hired this little egg beater car <laughs> cars are going like 200 past me and i'm like shaking out the wheel just <laughs> hadn't slept for like 24 hours S got there that night saw my buddies from oz that were there that you know they were, they've been chasing this way for forever ross clark and that were there yeah went to sleep woke up that next morning at five they drove me down to the harbor in the dark hadn't seen the wave like literally haven't laid eyes on it i got out there they had a ski organized for me to jump on. They had a, I had a borrowed tow board that I hadn't even put my feet in. So like when you have straps on your tow board, you can like gauge to whether how tight they are, yeah. if, they, if they're even the right stance. If you can even get in them. And like the guy might have a whole different stance to you. I didn't even get a chance to put my feet in it. He's like, jump on. Everything was so rushed. These guys have been waiting like months over there for this swell. And I rock in thing, I'm going to paddle. It's like like the biggest swell they've had all year and i'm like i haven't towed in for i don't know like two years just been paddling that's all all i've been focusing on um had no tow board borrowed stuff got out there the lights just coming so up it's setting up to be a cracker like literally <laughs> just got out there and my buddy was pretty comfortable out there on the ski and he's like fucking with me like we're in the like right where the waves are about to break and because they're it stands up for so long out of these huge canyons that like from the ways i'm used to surfing if you see a swell like that it's breaking it's yeah. going to hit a ledge and it's going to go from zero to 100 and literally like Explode go square yeah. and you've and you're screwed if you're anywhere near it like sitting there on a ski and he's like toying with it like knowing that i'm not used to it i'm like man what are you doing like like if you screw up at Nazare on a ski that early in the morning and there's no other ski there, you're screwed. There's a cliff and like where we're sitting, if, we, if our ski broke down or like if we flipped on the ski and something happened, you got no safety and no one's going to get you and you're on the cliff and you're dead like your cactus. <laughs> um, he's like, you want to go? 
I was like, not really. I'll, like, you go first. He's like, nah, oh, I'm going to wait a bit. Who are you with on the ski? Oh, um, so it was Ross Clark Jones and two guys from WA that you probably wouldn't have heard of. Heard of. They're just some un- more underground guys that just charge. Yeah. Like crazy. Um, and they're like, yeah, no. Nah. Ross and the other guy were like waiting for waves and... I was like, yeah, I'll try it out. I said, take me down to the beach where it's a little bit smaller. Like it's still like 30 feet. Yeah. And um, and so he's whipped me in. First wave I got whipped into, just cartwheeled. Like hit this chop that was, the chops like in the wave are like six foot high. So like moguls, like. Um, yeah, like, like downhill skiing or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I've, I'm riding, riding this tow I wanted to fill it out. And I got whipped into a wave and just cartwheeled down the face. And luckily, it was so big, it, it wasn't really breaking. Like, it just... Yeah, it has those weird ones that kind of just rolls through, away. Eh? Yeah, exactly. So, I was lucky that I fell early enough where I didn't suck me over the falls. And um, and then I kind of was over it. Like, I'm like, I'm like risking, you know, myself to... It wasn't worth it. And I sat back and I'm like, all right, you're up. First wave I whip him into. And, like, if someone goes down at this spot, it's heavy if they get sucked in like if they fall if you fall off in general out there it's gnarly if they get fall off and they get pushed on the inside Mm. you literally it's that's the sketchiest thing that you can literally do at nazareth is to go in to grab them because there's whitewash you can't get uh the the ski cavitates yeah yeah, yeah. and that's why you see skis getting blasted up the beach there all the time yeah right first way it's like there's so much turbulence they're not actually pushing against water it's just just mix of air and spray yeah exactly so first wave i've never like been there for an hour i whip him in to the biggest wave he's ever had he's like <laughs> he's, i'm looking at him I'm like you want it he's like yeah yeah whip him so. in too deep he eats shit he's oh. down like the, everyone like in the channel is like he's down he's down i'm like first thing i can think of is like are you fucking serious like this is the last thing i want to be doing like i've been here for an hour i haven't slept and he's gone down first wave the biggest wave he's ever had and I have to go in to grab him. And, mate, it was, it was gnarly. Like, literally had to beach the ski and, like, just, yeah, it was, it was gnarly. The, the first, like, two hours of being there, it was just... You are just like, fuck, I'm over it. Let's go. Jesus, home. it was gnarly. You wanted some two-foot snapper, didn't you? Two-foot two foot snapper felt pretty good at that <laughs> stage. <laughs> it's so... But back to, your, back to your point, yeah. It's um, planning for me is pretty, pretty abnormal. Yeah, I just find it, I find it hard to commit. And I, I wonder too, if I'm like, am I just going for the best thing? But you sort of have to, you know what I mean? Like you, some, if you make a plan and get locked into something, there's always something bit potential. There's always a bigger fish in a way. So it's like, you've, well, you got to go to see that bigger fish. Yeah. Like if, if you don't commit to it. Yeah. But I know what you mean. Like committing too far advanced yeah, kind you of could just blow something that's yeah. life-changing and yeah. it's like it's hard and i've i've got in a place where i've let so many people down based on like yeah yeah i'll do that and then something happens that i can't avoid and it's like whether it's financially or career-wise like you've got to take it like oh for sure and I, a lot of people don't it's hard for people to like wrap their head around that you know like why would you you said you'd do it and it's like fuck man like when you've when you've just scraping by or you've been pushing so hard and this is an opportunity you've been waiting for and i guess it'd be similar with swells then it's like sorry like that's where the pro like i guess like you said you have to be selfish in a lot of ways to make shit happen well yeah especially in your line of work and you know what i do as well it's just you're expected to be there like and if you're not there's another dude that will take your job yeah exactly like yeah if red bull you know, calls up and like that Alaska thing. And they're like, Jace, you got to go to Alaska right now. We've, we've decided we're going to film it. Cause that, like they've been doing this event forever. Yeah. It's called Arctic man up in, um, Oh, I've heard of that. Yeah. It's Levi the Valley. What, what's and, it all about? Oh, it's the gnarliest shit ever. It's like so underrated. They've never filmed it. And, um, basically you've got, you go to the top, right? You got a downhill skier. There's these two peaks and it's called the tip. And it's like in, it's like six hours north of Anchorage, man, like full North Pole. Wow. And you go up there and there's the skier starts on the top of the tit. And um, then they go down, they do like a crazy downhill ski run. And then the um, the guy in the snowmobile, it goes flat through this canyon, right? Yeah, so the right. guy in the snowmobile, like, 
they time there's a fucking wakeboard rope behind the what? behind the thing the driver of the skis uh holding it he's going through hands it off to the skier skier grabs it goes back 18 miles an hour man whips them up through this canyon and then they go out onto the flats pin it on the flats and then there's another downhill section the ski dude like they pull on the ski like you know when you wake sounds like or the something. best thing ever is it's it gnarly, and they've dude. never documented it properly never really hey so they're like and it was just like this really underground event like it's just full bogans dude like alaska so it's like bogans. A, it's like the australian um tinny racing yeah yeah version of- big time dude but <laughs> yeah. like twenty thousand people rock up to this thing and um yeah so then anyway the guy lets go of the the um the ski and then just sends it they got this huge jump like the videos on red bull i don't have to uh, check this out yeah it's fucking wild man so it's like 85 miles an hour like the ice that's hitting him off the back of the ski and oh, um, from the tracks of the yeah for the yeah, ski. yeah and he's just getting pumped dude and uh, so it's darren wow. ralphs he was an olympic um uh, skier for red bull yeah. so yeah they teamed up and he's won it a couple times then they have like the problem is that the skis aren't really meant to go that fast so everyone's trying to get like the maximum speed out of these skis yes so a lot of people just blow their shit up and um so yeah something happened this year like that it's crazy because like the snow was or not this year the year i did it um the snow was like wet the day before we were testing right and then it dried out overnight so it's like rocks yeah so they well they run this gearing and it the tracks worked better with this gearing in the wet snow and as soon as it dried out they needed to go back to their old setup right so anyway they ended up getting fourth or fifth or something but it's just like this crazy event and like red bull calls up the day like the day before did you know anything about it before never even heard of it man yeah never been to alaska i've heard of it but i never had what's been off like 30 years wow yeah but that's like that you talk about that opportunity thing is they they go like um hey i need like we just decided we're going to film this um do you want to be the dude that does it and it was like was it wasn't even for very much money and i was just but you know the producers that are behind it and you know how the whole kind of ecosystem works yeah and i was like fucking ding I'd and love, then like I'd love eight to. hours later i'm on a plane to alaska and dude i had not like i went to burton down the road in hollywood like i was living in, in beverly hill uh hollywood beverly hills at the time yeah and um i went down on sunset boulevard to burton and um and bought like thermals and shit (laughs) i was like man i had no i couldn't find my boots so i was wearing like nike tennis shoes and it was like negative 30 or something those things would be wet oh it was two hours it was so bad um but yeah like that thing i if i had something else planned i would have just like fucking x that and you have to go so it's like you just it pays to stay as loose as you can and if i didn't go then oh yeah i'm sure any other kid with a camera would have got it and and it was a dope experience like the to be in alaska and be in those mountains and like i'm i'll be honest that was one of the most scared i've ever been in my life like i've grown up racing. oh really oh fuck bro like the mountain ranges the were just mountains like were so cliffs. oh yeah and so i'm on a snowmobile like this is this is like the thing right like people don't you know there's always the things people don't get about what you have to do when you're like oh i go do this and oh, you're yeah. like oh sick that yeah, must yeah. Be right. so the, with me like they like fly to alaska barely have enough clothes and then they go all right that's your snowmobile i was like what do you mean like well you got to get around like i was the only filmer so it's like oh wow yeah so it was just like yeah it was full bare bones they just wanted to document it because yep. like no one at red bull had even seen really this event apart from some photos and it's pretty um, cool how they support that stuff hey dude like, they had like the full red bull tent there and like they they definitely put a bit into it it's smart like there's so many things that people do like just off the wall off crazy the, yeah. shit. but yeah so i get on this snowmobile and it's like i'm lucky i've rode bikes my whole life yeah so i get on this thing i got like sixty thousand dollars worth of cameras strapped to me my tripod i got no food no water no nothing and this thing's like miles dude and you had a cliff bit. like this like oh just put the handbrake on like. and the, the sled was a piece of shit like i went out there the first time and there's like thousands and thousands and thousands of people out there so the just, tracks are just getting like chewed out man so it's like just whoops out. it was like the fink like desert race in australia yeah right raw 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 the whole time i got all this shit like trying to i crashed the ski like a, a, like three or four times i'd be freaked out that like how do you just park it like because you'd be filming like 
Well, yeah, you just got yeah, you just got to Or did you have to hike hike up? I did a a fair bit of hiking as well. But like, man, some of the shit, and you know what it's like when you're in the snow. You get no perspective of how steep something is. I'm just like looking at these ice walls, dude. Like they look twenty stories high. And you're just going like, and just the ski's go, a piece of shit. You're about to go see this ski into about a thousand people at the bottom of the hill. Dude, I had a couple of times. So they ended up renting me like a better ski with more horsepower because yeah. this thing just couldn't get up these hills. I had one dude, I went up and got halfway up it and then turned and like, you're oh on God. an angle like that. And because I was like, it was either bail and fuck the ski. What's the deal with it? Like, how do you slow them down and stuff? I don't know. I think, I don't even, I think they got brakes on the back. I would never. I've never to, even been on one. I'm trying to remember now, to be honest. It, was like it must a, have a break on the yeah, tracks to stop it. Yeah, right? yeah. It's just all. It's actually yeah. It's on the tracks. But um, yeah, like at the top of the where we were filming um, or basing for the most part was pretty flat. Like you get to the top of the big hills, like so you can't park it. Yeah. But yeah, just to get there was just like these ridiculous hills, man. And the first time going out there, I was just like, what the fuck am I doing? What am I, what am I myself in And I was so there? cold as well. So you like, you add in all those like external factors. But yeah, the first time I tried to get up this one main hill to get out there, I just, the thing didn't have enough power to get up it. So I've just turned man, on this <laughs> angle and like I'm at the top and it's like drifting down. Oh, I'm like, oh, 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 trying to like get it to turn back down. But then I ended up saying to one of the guys that was with me, he's like a really little dude and he didn't have any equipment or anything and he was yeah. on like a 700 horsepower fucking well, 700 up. cc thing and um and i was just like give me that it was just what just yeah. pinned it up there but like there was one shot we went up through this canyon and i was like oh i'll get this cool shot of you coming through here so i rode up to this peak and uh one of the guys was like oh damn man that's like brave going up there and i was like why he's like oh that i like, dude died in an avalanche there a couple of years ago Oh, wow. And I'm like, well, fucking thanks. Like, <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh, I just thought you knew what you were doing. I was like, I got no idea, man. I didn't yeah. see snow till I was 20, 24 years old. Leading no band in Alaska on a yeah, ridge was, line or something. Yeah, it was just sketchy. And then like I almost fell out of a helicopter and like it was just full wow. on, like I a, a full on trip. I had a crazy experience. I um I go over to New Zealand a little bit. Well, I've, not a lot, but I've been probably three times now. And uh, I've got a buddy that does the uh heli tours over oh there. really yeah and um he's like you gotta come over it's amazing you know obviously new zealand's pretty close you can get direct flights you know straight there straight from tweed straight from tweed and uh <laughs> yeah so i went over and i'm not an amazing snowboarder like i can do it but i wouldn't say like i'm that great yeah and so i jump in with him his wife and their skiers and they're really good Oh, from, so you're heli to a snowboarding in yeah, New Zealand. in New Zealand. Yeah, right. And I didn't realize how good it was. But, you know, he's, his wife was a really good skier, or still is. Um, and he's a good skier. They're, they're from Canada. He, he travels the whole world just doing the heli winter, to Winter, winter, winter. Yeah. And so he's like, I've told him that I can snowboard, but I'm not great. And, and he's just got this expectation because of your surfing that you probably just send it. Yeah, yeah. So, like, the first first day we're there, you know, he's taking me up onto these, you know, cliffs and, you know, all this. We've got avalanche packs on and all this shit. Yeah. And um, I'm like, man, I, I don't think you realize, like, I'm not that good. Can we start <laughs> off on something pretty easy? Yeah. And uh, he's like, no, you're right. You're good. And um, ski is, like, you know, obviously, like, pretty tight, you know, runs and, and pretty sort of challenging stuff. And I was like, fuck, I'd like something, you know, pretty wide open. Mm. And, um, man, the first thing that he, he dropped us off on, I was just like, wow, this is hectic. You know, I nearly killed myself. I caught an edge going through like a really tight, is that a crevasse they call it or something? Um, or something like that, a little canyony sort of yeah, like, like a, a canyon. Like two ridges. A ridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like two ridge lines. Caught an edge and just started cartwheeling. Fuck that. And, um, and he, he actually seen it because he was behind me. He let me go first. And um, he's like, throwing you in the deep end, eh, bro? <laughs> you know how they talk? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, you fucking prick. Um, but yeah, and, and I went over, I've been over twice since and it's like my little getaway. Love yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. But he's, it's, you can easily, you know, get, get yourself, out. you can get caught out. And yeah. like he's, he's even taken us to runs that he hasn't done or just heard of or, his friends have marked out mm. and like i'm like i'm way in over my head but it was cool because like i've seen 
people do that and surf where I'm looking at them just going, you shouldn't be out here. You bro. shouldn't be out here. Yeah. He's like, he's given me the look before. Like, yeah. nah, like, yeah, let's see. And everything can... looks pretty safe in the snow. There it's... was a few things that well, I was like, yeah, what are you doing? Like, yeah. And it, I could tell he was freaked out that I was there. And I'm like, this is sketchy. Yeah. But I... he, he was like, no, no, it's sweet. Like, but I could see in his eyes that he was freaking yeah, I yeah. I definitely like because we grew up in Cairns, so like put me in the outback with no nothing, like just give me some water and I'll I feel pretty You're confident. A I feel pretty confident I'm coming home. Yeah, but if you if you left me on that fucking hill in Alaska, go on. Who knows if I yeah. came home? Like it's it's just a, I guess what you're used to as well. But like I feel super uncomfortable when I'm in like back country snowboarding well, sort of situation i guess it wouldn't take that long right if you didn't have the right stuff that's the thing you, you, it's a race against a clock really and it's do's and don'ts man like if yeah. you like i know so like i know do's and don'ts it's say in like an outback situation where i can you know where you can walk where you can drink where what fish you can eat what yeah. fish you can't eat what like there's just that kind of check you're growing up with that exactly and you, you you don't even know well you that's don't know second, what you don't know that's just second nature but yeah you throw yourself in a whole different element and they're just like well you just don't know the kind of stuff that can catch you out and like they're looking at ridge lines going like avalanche avalanche no that's yeah sweet. exactly and they look to us they look the exact and same. like he's saying like don't cut you're gonna have to bomb this line because yeah if you cut the, you, if you the start, pack will go yeah. yeah and he's like no you straight down and then you can start turning i'm like fuck that are you serious i don't need that <laughs> But I, I sometimes relate what you guys do in your big wave realm to um, being like backcountry skiing. It's like a lot of first oh, yeah. descents are going down. You know what I mean? It's like, sure. it's unforgiving. There's no, um, like you think about, like pipe's heavy as fuck, obviously. Like we know yeah. that's not like a joke wave. But a pipe is like the half pipe at the ski resort. Yeah, exactly. The ski resort's right there. The medics are right there. You know what I mean? Like yes. you can kind of get back to the, you can get back to the resort in a way. Yes. Obviously it's fucking dangerous to send it in the half pipe, but you're closer. But when you go out to like the right and cow bombing and you know, like those kind of, you know, nausea, you're off cliffs. So it's like what you guys do to me is almost like leave the ski resort and go way out and especially try and survive in a way. Especially in Oz too, you know, like, a lot of these spots are in the middle of nowhere. The right is literally in the middle of nowhere. Do pe- is that like people know where that is or is that still kind of under wraps? It's still pretty under wraps, yeah. Yeah. How like, many dudes do you reckon have surfed it? Oh, look, probably 28 or 30. I don't know. That not, few people. Yeah. Oh, there's not a whole lot of people that Can. want to surf it. Yeah. Or they surf it once and they don't go back. Yeah. I mean, I don't like surfing it that yeah. much. You know, I've i've surfed it a lot i'm happy with what i've done out there i don't really have anything else to prove um and it's not really a huge focus getting whipped into you know waves like that you know i'm really keen to push the boundaries of of paddling in and i feel like you know that's where the the future of you know big wave surfing is obviously they've gone in separate ways you know the toe Mm. surfing things how big is the wave you know the biggest wave you can get the slab things you know obviously the biggest barrel They've all got their place, but I'm pretty happy with, you know, paddling jaws and, and you know, doing that sort of stuff. Um, the consequences, like slab surfing, are way up there. Yeah. Yeah, especially, you know, places you're like dealing, the right and stuff. And you're not dealing just with the drowning thing. You're dealing with the impact. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like when you fall off there, it's like, you know, the volume of water that's focused on that small part of the reef is just magnified. Yeah. You know? So... Yeah, the, the margin for errors is, you know, pretty pretty high. But you can go out and surf and not even fall off. At the right? Yeah. Yeah. But then you can go out and every wave you just get getting pumped. a two-wave hold down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, That's fucking heavy. But yeah, I, I definitely relate what you guys do back to more of that whole backcountry. And there seems to be more of like a, you know, like that core element. of. I, I felt it when I went, I know... You know, there's a whole earn your turns sort of stuff. Yeah, big time, dude. Um, but even when I was doing the heli stuff in New Zealand, like I, it felt exactly the same. 
like the elements like obviously i was in way of my head and like a lot of guys would look at that that are really good skiers and go that was nothing piece of piece yeah but for me like it was it had that same relevance as, as surfing big waves and and being you know nowhere near any sort of safety and yeah you know and, and that like i loved it yeah you feel well, it's exposed, like it's eh? such a, a crazy fun feeling you know i think um, it was fun to be a kook and just yeah think everything was like be a pretty wild yeah <laughs> i think like it's you you see guys like look at shane dorian with like his hunting and then you know you see like mark healy with his free diving it's like i feel like the older generation of you like you big wave guys there you, is you you're, find you're trying to find yeah. that it it does become from the outside like a soulful mission it's like you exposing yourself against it's real it's raw it doesn't seem like you can't fabricate it there's no bells and whistles there's no it sort of just seems like you really isolated against something that's really hard well it's it's one of those experiences once you've felt um that exposure to elements like that and once you once you've had that feeling of being so close to nature and and things that can potentially harm you you are kind of looking for that you know obviously the surfing side of thing does give that to you but you find it again when you pick up stuff yeah. like you know the backcountry skiing or the hunting or the free diving or the spear fishing it, you know what i mean that i love spear fishing when i do it because it kind of relates a lot to yeah. surfing big waves and the, the snowboarding stuff is fun too and i feel like um it just rejuvenizes rejuvenizes that feeling that you you got when surfing was fresh yeah and what like what does that then carry back into your normal life happiness <laughs> yeah and it's but it's like um you know when people get like really frazzled in their life and they get like it I guess caught up and like oh, i'm fucking so busy i don't have time to you know what I mean? like yeah. is there like a calming element of exposing yourself in that way and feeling that vulnerability and like that really like i always talk about a time when i went to scotland i went there for the first time and i stood at the bottom of this mountain and it was it seems fucking kooky but i just stood there and there was these goats that looked like they were three trillion years old yeah and there were these like woolly um these like woolly buffalo with like these huge horns and like i didn't have any visual of anything man-made yes and everything was behind me that was man-made and i just saw this landscape that was so big and so old and it was freezing cold and it was stormy and it like it gave me this real picture of like insignificance yeah and i think like i think in a way that i kind of think about when when i've done that same in alaska i had that insignificance of like nature doesn't give a fuck like the world doesn't care no one cares you're here like i guess people care but the world as a whole will smash you and move on without even blinking an eyelid and then it's almost like when you take that back into your normal life it's like a calming thing well almost. nothing yeah nothing phases you phases you as much yeah because you're like i felt really insignificant then yeah <laughs> like who cares if like you got a bill to pay yeah or it's overdue two weeks yeah yeah your you netflix know? is cut off yeah like it's you know it, it puts everything in perspective yeah i'm um yeah I, I feel like you do get caught up with chasing stuff that takes you away from that though yeah that's what is kind of frustrating a little bit for me like i'd love to focus more on stuff that gives me that yeah but obviously it's not super sustainable it's not super sustainable like you're not you have to be a pretty good hunter to get paid to hunt and yeah. like and then that takes maybe some of the elements away from it if you're getting paid to hunt yeah, because true. you're like expecting this and this yeah so it's like if yeah for me like i'd love to have that feeling with other stuff i'd love to be able to dive more i'd love to be able to go snowboard more but um the reason why i'd like to do that more is because i know what those feelings give me mm. you know and it's i feel like you, you sometimes you chase the wrong things in life and you get caught up in chasing those things where if you bring it back and you focus on chasing things that 
give you those right feelings, then that's uh, I think that's when you're on the right track. So yeah, and then I think using those feelings that you get as a positive on the rest of the stuff. So yeah. it's like coming yes. away from a trip and harnessing that feeling and then applying that into life. Because I think, yeah, I, I definitely can get like fully snapped in that zone of like when you're in, you know, Alaska or Scotland or these crazy places or you, um, like I, I probably don't do enough stuff where I dig, have to dig super deep. Like I've been trying to get a bit of that in training and and want like maybe competitions and stuff like in the future yeah because it's it is good to be in that deep water and then come out of it and then you can apply that but yeah i I think that's i guess maybe the the key to it all is like i think you nailed it too when you said that if if that becomes a job it takes away from that because i mean i i stopped racing motocross when i started filming it for a living yeah right so i was like well i'm over it yes you know you need these I needed that other thing and I had this lifelong passion for racing and then I just was like, no, nah, I'm done. But it's funny now I can kind of appreciate a day out with my mates and I, I you turn off that competitive side of I it. I guess that's what I was trying to say before yeah. with the big wave thing, you know, like will there be a time where I just like go, that's it, you know, like I don't want to surf big waves anymore. I'd be more happy just to, yeah. to go on an Indo trip with my friends and score perfect waves, Yeah, you know. Um, because you do have to be in that state, you know, like for you, when you stop racing moto, you're probably like, well, I'm not just going to go out and try to beat the 14 year old down the local track. Well, it's like when you know what you were capable, (laughs) not that I was ever very good, but I could ride at a level that when I stopped doing it, like focusing on it a lot, I couldn't keep up that level anymore. And then it's not interesting. And then anymore. it's not fun or you yes. don't get that feeling. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to be like a shit version of yourself that you were. And you were living in the past. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. that's what I was trying to get at before. Yeah, I get it. You know, yeah. um, I feel like to do something like that, you, I, for me, I'd want to be able to at least sustain my level that I'm at now or at least better myself. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Because I think that's why I ride mountain bikes a lot. Because when I grew up, I raced mountain bikes before I ever raced motocross. And we were the kids that lived on BMX bikes. Yes. We didn't have PlayStations and stuff like that. Like we were the BMX rats that made jumps in every park and every, like ride them everywhere. And then I got, all I wanted to do was race motocross, got into that, then stopped when I started filming. And now I love riding mountain bikes so much because I can do it at 70% and keep up with everyone and i can like i'm competitive but without risking it the way that you have to risk it to yeah be on a motocross bike like yeah it makes to, sense to go to have fun on a motocross bike i've got to be pretty uncomfortable and like my fitness isn't as good i'm yeah I'm getting sideways i'm scaring myself i don't want to do those jumps anymore so then yeah you're like this isn't fun now because i have to try so much harder than i ever did and now and i'm it, sketchy when i am doing the shit that used to be super easy, easy yeah yeah <laughs> so that's why i like mountain biking because i'm like oh, i can just cruise at 70 percent, and it feels as good as 100 percent. yeah like exactly. if i'm going 100 percent on a mountain bike i'm like what are you doing dude like yeah. just relax so yeah. yeah i can't yeah i get what i get where you're going with that one now. yeah yeah it's just it's hard to know until you're in that space or you know and people yeah. change too they do that's the thing where yeah like the stuff that is interesting or fulfilling at one point in your life just doesn't give you the same thing well i think it's back to that point yeah that you're getting that feeling because you were sending it so much or you're at such a high level and then when you you, when you're not at that level anymore and you're not pushing it it doesn't give you that feeling anymore because you're not there yeah you know i haven't thought thought about it that way as much yeah of yeah and i feel like that's why you know people try to chase other things yeah that give them that feeling of being fresh again like hunting or spearing or something or snowboarding well i guess like yeah like you said it 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 is good to be a white belt oh yeah a lot of times because i think that's probably well i guess too because there's like so much growth in that phase yeah you know what i mean you have to learn yeah yeah and a lot of time a lot of times you got to learn quick yeah because you're throwing yourself in the deep and you got that mentality of pushing yourself in that same sort of arena and then you think you can just go do that somewhere else 
it's kind of like you got to learn pretty quick and that's exciting yeah and then i guess too is like the better you get at surfing or whatever then the harder you have to push to get that same white belt feeling oh for sure and then that's when you like you said you start getting into that sketchy territory yeah exactly yeah even now yeah like yeah Big like for, for me like i have fun surfing ways around here but i it doesn't do much for me yeah that's what i was gonna actually yeah. say like how fun is it to go and surf like head high waves it must feel pretty it's it's fun but that must be all like because i i like i picture but it's not amazing yeah and it's i picture not. me duck diving a wave next year and seeing the thing that's broken in front of us like let's say like a big day at snapper and i'm probably fucking packing and you're just like not one bit there's no. not you're not even looking at it like a thing no because i remember like that again that white belt stage of when i was first surfing to that everything looked like it was going to blow my hands off the board and hold me down for longer than i wanted and then gradually you go but like so you have taken that to this level of the like, scary part is though is that when you are at that level and then like i was saying earlier with the the younger generation pushing it to the next level it gets pushed to a level like when i was at nazare that you aren't happy to continue with yeah like there was a couple of days where i was like i'm over it i'm not i'm not into this yeah and that's hard to to kind of come to to swallow yeah but i was for the first time in my whole career i was actually really comfortable okay with it i was okay with it i was like no like i don't need to do this yeah that's almost got to be a relief and it was it was the best feeling that i've had in a long time like i left the airport and instead of being in regret i was happy with it just obviously there was a few things in my mind saying oh maybe i should have like what am Mm. i doing but like in my heart i knew that i made the right decision like I, i was happy with walking away and and not pushing it whereas like when i was younger it would have eaten me like mm-hmm. it would have just been like you pussy like you know what the hell are you doing sort of yeah. thing you know like but it's pretty fun it's it's a good feeling being in that state where you you're comfortable enough to to know well you're you, driving you, the ship at yeah, that point yeah which yeah i guess that when you're going against your best judgment you're really not the one that's in control yeah and it's uncomfortable you're yeah. always on edge yeah so i guess yeah it did it it would have felt good to be like oh i'm i'm the captain now i'm i'm fucking doing this thing yeah yeah, but it's also like a feeling that you you there's other feelings that come with it too like it's a bit of a changing of the guard like yeah you see the bigger picture you see this younger generation coming like like that and like you're almost happy that they're it's like they're taking the pressure off you yeah like they're holding the flag to go like yeah next level and and so you kind of kind of get used to that feeling but you i feel like you generally enjoy yourself a bit more mm. yeah well mate we'll shut it down it's been fucking rad talking to you um it let, i've loved it get give everyone your social details and your whole thing and and maybe that press stuff you've been working on just whatever shout outs you can throw out throw them out there yeah i mean just for now i just do that stuff to stay sharp so i don't drown yeah but yeah, we've got classes um, every Tuesday afternoon at Palm Beach. Yep. And it's, yeah, it's... How would, how do people find that? Um, I've got an Instagram, yep. um, Breath Performance. Just go on that and send us a hit. I've got my number on there. Just give us a text if you want to join in. It's that simple. Sounds good. And uh, everybody keep an ear out. I'll post your podcast when it goes up. We'll um, let we'll, everyone know. We'll have that. to have another chat. Yeah. Continue it. Yeah, I'll come on yours. We'll, <laughs> yeah, bloody, we'll keep going. Right, no, I appreciate it. I hope you've, I hope you've had fun. It's been yeah, it. good talking to you, dude. Epic. Sounds yeah. good, mate. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no dramas. <laughs> Thanks for having me, mate. <laughs> <laughs>